really sorry for the interruption so as i said before uh, about our organization ifrp is a multidisciplinary professional organization and it's a preponderant body that has brought technical revolution and development of science and technology the ifrp form constitutes of professional experts and overseas technical leaders there is no stone unturned to strengthen the spheres of science engineering and technology these days ifrp is one among the leading publisher of research papers in its prime quality peer reviewed journals continuing in analysis magazine in coming about our conference wcact conferences it conducts throughout a year which of course is distributed through different parts of the world in a uniform manner wcact is have already been conducted in cities like kuala lumpur singapore dubai goa frankfurt jakarta and many more we aim to reach every nook and corner of the world to bring in talented individuals and to provide them a platform to showcase their findings ifrp generally conducts wcact conferences throughout the year which of course is distributed throughout different parts of the country so wcact is built on the confidence and constant support of its advisory board which represents different background culture diversity but with the sole aim of bringing a revolution in general solutions for current challenges with a multidisciplinary approach and within the next 5 years with the continuous help and support from people all across the world we dream of becoming the next biggest brand of multidisciplinary conferences in the asia pacific region and then conquer the world of a multidisciplinary approach for the betterment of mankind so next i would like to welcome i uh, would like to welcome our uh, dignitaries so first and foremost i would like to welcome our keynote speaker dr amitabh upadhyay provost and vice president in academic affairs at american college of dubai uae thank you for joining us sir and imparting your expertise with us i would also take this opportunity to welcome our presenters who has paid the valuable time in enlightening us with the latest research studies so next i would like to welcome and invite our chief technology officer mr ranjan sabra from technore hope i am audible to everyone yes <clears throat> thank you so much invite mr ranjan subra our chief technology officer to deliver to deliver our welcome speech thank you sneget very good morning to one and all i'd like to start by wishing you and your families my personal best for your help and safety in these difficult times on behalf of ifrp and wcsd it's my great pleasure to welcome all the delegates keynote speakers session chairs committee members academicians young researchers participants and students for impressive 34th world conference on applied science engineering and technology organized by ifrp the theme of the conference is technological developments and modern trends in applied science and advanced engineering due to covid-19 pandemic this conference is conducted on 
digital platform in line with the social distancing norms. WCST will explore the new horizons of innovations from distinguished researchers, scientists, and eminent authors in academia and industry working for the advancements in applied science, engineering, and technology from all over the world. IFERP is one of the largest non profitable or professional associations meant for research and development in the field of science, engineering, and technology. The worldwide acknowledged brand WCST was given birth by IFERP on 2nd January 2016 at Goa. Aiming in closing the gap between researchers and academicians of different streams and bringing experts from all fields together so that the solutions for today's global changes can be generated. WCST provides an opportunity for professionals globally to discuss about particular topics so the creation of ideas may be bigger than we are thinking. The aim of the conference is to create solutions in different ways and to share innovative ideas in the field of science, science engineering, management, and technology. WCCT provides a world stage to the researchers, professionals, scientists, academicians, and students engage in very challenging conversations, access the current body of research, and determine knowledge and capability gaps. WCCT has been already organized in the cities like Kuala Lumpur, Singapore, Dubai, Goa, Frankfurt, Jakarta, Bangkok, Manila, and Australia. We dream of becoming the next biggest brand of the multidisciplinary conferences in the Asia Pacific region and then conquer the world of multidisciplinary approach for the betterment, betterment of man, mankind. The first WCCT was organized on 2nd and 3rd Jan. 2016 at Goa. Now it was grown to the 34th WCST and was organized in more than 10 countries. The upcoming conference of WCST organized in Vietnam, Thailand, Indonesia, Philippines, Malaysia, and India. IFRP connect engineers, exchange global innovations, and act as bridge between researchers and academicians by organizing international conferences, international workshops, seminars, guest lectures, short-term training programs, providing professional student and institutional membership, establishing student chapters, faculty exchange programs, implant training in NOOC and corners of the world through our globally distributed executive committee members to reduce the gap between curriculum and their practical implementation among students and the research scholars. On this special occasion, I welcome all the eminent speakers and guests from all over the countries who have joined here and share their knowledge, vast experience with the student community. I am very grateful to our distinguished keynote speaker, Dr. Amita Upadha, Provost and Vice President, American College of Dubai, United Arab Emirates, DMMC Institute, Health Science, Philippines. I, exp I express my sincere gratitude to our session chairs, Ms. Maria Ithro Plow, Assistant Professor, UAE University, and Ms. Micheline Bizani, Assistant Professor, American University in Dubai, UAE. To put a conference of this magnitude together is not a small task. To that end, I would like to welcome all our advisory committee members, organizing committee members. Lastly, I would like to welcome all the conference participants who are going to share the knowledge and researchers, which is the foundation of this conference. Thank you all. The mic is muted. Sringit, you can unmute. You need to unmute your microphone. Unmute your mic. Your mic is <clears throat> muted. 
I'm, I'm really sorry. Uh, I'm sorry for the uh, uh, just a small uh, understanding. So, uh, sir, thank you so much, Mr. Ranjan Shubra, for your valuable speech. So, I would like to welcome our eminent keynote speaker, Dr. Amitha Bhopadhyaya, to deliver his valuable keynote address. So, you can proceed, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, I greetings from the UAE to all the delegates, all the distinguished guests, and everybody who is participating in this <clears throat> conference. Am I audible and clear? Uh, because we are using yes, yes we are using uh, a remote uh, platform, and that is the norm of the day because of the pandemic and because of the divine disruption that has happened to the to the globe uh, in form of uh, this pandemic. I'm really very happy to be attending this uh, and speaking to all of you in a conference which uh, talks about and which will be deliberating technology, uh, social sciences, uh, physical sciences into uh, one platform. And uh, just now, uh, Mr. Ranjan was talking about multidisciplinary and so on. That certainly is uh, the order of the day. And a few points that I have to make uh, in, in, in my today's address uh, is start with this uh, area itself, uh, this, this topic itself. I'm uh, not uh, a person from technology background. I'm a person from social sciences background. But due to the pandemic, uh, we are uh, all becoming so techno savvy that uh, we, are, we have started uh, liking uh, the, the miracles of technology, which are bringing us closer in this part, in, in, in these times of uh, the pandemic. And that gives me uh, a thought to, to ponder over that will tomorrow the uh, nature and structure of university and college programs be the same. Today, if a student wants to graduate into a particular field, he or she starts looking for the best programs available in the world or in the country or region where the person resides. And those programs are so structured that they offer a science stream, a technology stream, a medical science stream, a social science stream, an arts or humanities stream, a commerce stream, etc., etc., etc. But they are all quite straight jacketed. They are all quite uh, structured in such a way that you do not have other options to explore, even if you are pursuing uh, an academic uh, pathway. Now today, when everything is available on the click of a button uh, of your computer or your uh, smartphones or your tablets, is it necessary that I pursue a, a undergraduate degree, BSc or BTech or MBBS or BBA, or should I, or if I have an interest simultaneously in, in economics, in history, in, in uh, physics, can I combine my knowledge of physics with my knowledge of or with my interest or passion of history for that matter? Uh, how can uh, somebody decide that if you are choosing a science stream, you cannot or you should not be interested in history or uh, uh, social science or anything else? Now that is opening a new vista altogether of looking into the structure of higher education. Of course, there will be so, so much deliberation going on. And because this platform is offering a lot of multidisciplinary interactions, there is a possibility. Uh, and I would like this possibility to be explored by the delegates and the ses session chairs to, to talk about it, whether there can be a synergy between two or three different streams of studies and creating a, a a personality or, 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 a, or a, a scholarly result, which is satisfying the intellectual quest of uh, an individual who wants to be a physicist side by side along with uh, an economist because technology and economy 
uh, economics go together these days. You cannot have uh, a good technological solution unless and until it is economically viable. So, uh, and similarly, if you do not understand the political and historical background of the region where you want to utilize that technology, you may still not be so, so successful. So there is always a possibility of having understanding of the, of the political, of the economic, of the social background of the region where you want to apply a particular kind of technology and that technology may be suitable only to that particular environment, uh, socio-political, uh, economic environment and so on and so forth. So that is the first point that I would like uh, to, to, to throw open to the delegates of this, this, this conference. And I would also uh, wish that some kind of such deliberation takes place and, and, and some uh, results come out of that discussion after the uh, conference is over. The second point, uh, which is a little, uh, I mean, sometimes people don't like uh, what I keep on saying as far as conferences and publications are concerned. The higher education model, which is, uh, used all over the world th uh, these days, the, uh, the academics who are part of this entire uh, global uh, higher education uh, system, uh, the, the term that, or, or the sentence that becomes, you know, uh, as a, um, is thrown to them as a threat the moment you join uh, a higher education institution as a teacher, as, as a professor uh, or whatnot, as an academic uh, generally. Uh, publish or perish. Now, under the pressure of publications, a lot of such uh, platforms and journals and uh, uh, forums are available where academicians, especially the younger people who are getting initiated into research and publication, get involved into that. And, and they are under pressure to somehow, anyhow publish in all streams. Of course, science and technology offers much more scope and possibilities because even if your experiment uh, fails, uh, that becomes a publishable uh, commodity. I'm, I'm sorry to use the term. And in social sciences, yes, you have to come out with something which, which, which is after peer reviews uh, accepted by your seniors or by the managers of that particular journal. Now what is happening under that pressure, we are producing large quantity of research, whether that research is useful or not, whether that research is applicable or not, whether that research is uh, solving any problems or not, providing any solutions or not, Almost 75 to 80%, I'm, I'm, I'm being uh, modest in, in my estimation, it can be 90% or 95% of researches being produced out of universities and colleges throughout the world are consigned to or buried into uh, various journals and, and, and pages of, of, uh, of uh, these publications and conferences and is never referred to backwards for the purpose of any kind of application. So which is a, a, a question that all of us should answer. Uh, let me tell you a story which uh, it, it's, it's just a normal thing. And every time I speak to academics around uh, on any forum, uh, I uh, am tempted to talk about it. And it, this is a story about two adventurists uh, you know, the balloonists, they, they uh, you know, the uh, hot uh, air balloons in which people go up in the air for the purpose of uh, roaming around uh, as an adventure sport. So two of them went into uh, a balloon uh, for, a, for a ride uh, in a very good weather. And after traveling in that balloon for about 20, 25 minutes or half an hour, as luck would have it, the wind direction changed and their balloon uh, got uh, swayed away in a different direction altogether for miles. And suddenly they realized that they have lost uh, their way and, and they are lost, they don't know where they are. 
so uh, looking down below they found uh, some some uh, some uh, uh, place where people were there some buildings were there so they lowered their balloon and they found a few very intelligent looking smart people middle aged and old aged uh, and and they asked uh, sir who are you he said this is a university and i am a professor so he said uh, professor can you tell me uh, can you tell us where are we and the professor looked up scratched his head made a few uh, calculations uh, mental uh, maths or whatever and said you are in a balloon now uh, they, those two people looked into each other's eyes and said to each other yes the professor is right but it doesn't solve our problem in most of the cases we professors have been quite right in producing uh publications and researches but is it solving anybody's problem that is the question that i am once i am once again compelled to ask and throw open to all those who are participating should we be publishing for the sake of publication should we be participating in conferences for the sake of participation should we be uh, doing research for the sake of research because we are under pressure to do that uh, it is a, it, it is for the sake of our survival or a better system has to be uh, derived for the purpose of uh, coming out with meaningful researches and, and and only those who would be interested in doing that because there are so many 90% of us may be very good teachers and students who are studying in various institutions want to have good teachers then uh, better researchers for that matter and those who are researchers should be given all opportunities to to go for Uh, researches and solve problems because these problems that uh, are identified from time to time uh, some of uh, the technology and uh, uh, business management sciences and other social science uh, experts and scholars are well equipped to solve these uh, problems and bring in uh, better results and solutions uh, coming to my uh, last point uh, as far as Uh, my uh, discussion uh, or address is concerned at the moment is about uh, what uh, should be because there has been i have noticed not as much into tech, uh, technology and uh, physical sciences but my area of social sciences and uh, especially business management and uh, such uh, social sciences what i have noticed i'm sorry for those who may be from the technology background and uh, may not relate to this example but from the point of view of my area of uh, academia uh, i would like to talk about methodology there is a lot of emphasis on methodology of how you pursue a particular research which is again a very very uh, i i should say it is not a very encouraging Uh, thing to do because unless and until a researcher goes into a fixed or a template of uh, methodology uh, more, in most of the cases the journals and the editors reject it at the desk level itself because it does not have say for example uh, a theoretical background it does not have uh, say for example uh, an elaborated uh, methodology or, or already tested methodology quantitative or qualitative or whatever it is uh, it is not uh, an unlike unlike physical sciences or medical sciences for that matter uh, the the structuring is a little too rigid where most of uh, the new generation academics find it quite difficult so what i am proposing again once again for those delegates who are participating and and the session uh, chairs who are uh, listening to these uh, presentations and researches and the reviewers who will ultimately be reviewing that uh, look into the intent look into the the problem which the researcher is trying to solve look into the the innovative innovative and creative methodology that the researcher may have utilized not exactly or um, fitting into the typical uh, uh, 
template that normally journals accept. Uh, but something, uh, if, for example, as, as, a, as a reviewer and as editor of various social sciences journals that I've been part of or am part of, uh, the moment I see some, uh, some uh, article submitted, it doesn't excite me. 90% or 95 or sometimes even 99% of such, uh, uh, such submissions do not excite uh, me because they are run of the mill, boring, pattern, uh, template filling, you know, just fixing uh, paragraphs here and there into various sections. What excites uh, me as, a, as an academic or as a reviewer or as an editor is something that is not been experimented before, something which is new, something that has been taken up uh, to solve a particular problem in a, in, a, in a creative way. As we teach our students from time to time, think out of the box. But when it comes to publications, when it comes to researches, we say, remain strictly within the box. The moment you go out of the box, you will be considered as, no, 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 this is not acceptable because our, our journal has these aims and these objectives and these parameters and these designs and these templates and so on. So, so that is also something that uh, all participants and delegates of this particular uh, conference must look into. And why I'm saying these, I've, I've talked about these three things uh, to, be, to be deliberated. I know uh, it, it is not on the agenda. I know it is not on, on, on the plate of anybody, but certainly during your discussions, if any one of these thoughts come into play and make a little uh, impact, uh, there is, I, I will consider the conference as well as uh, the, the organization of the conference to be more successful than others. Otherwise, what will be the difference between this conference and any other conference? The ambitions and, and the aspirations of organizers of this conference is to go uh, places uh, and they want to uh, run it uh, uh, on a longer basis. How should greater uh, academics, scholars, practitioners, uh, uh, scientists, technologists, be keen in, 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 in participating and, and, and deliberating in your conference or this conference in the future and get attracted to this instead of being uh, asked to come. Uh, that, is, that should be the aim. And that is possible only when there is a difference. It is not run of the mill. And deliberations change into uh, uh, newer things, uh, innovations and create, though, though the term innovativeness and creative creativity uh, are now much overused kind of terms and uh, have lost their, 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 their meaning, but they, they, they remain relevant. Uh, recently, in the last few years, a decade or so, the term disruption has been used regularly in all, you know, in technology also, in social sciences also in applied sciences also, in, in, in business and technology also. Now, today we are living in a time, and, and that is the term that I used at the beginning of my address itself, divine disruption. So God Almighty himself has uh, disrupted the, uh, the, the, the order uh, of human uh, society and, and asked the, uh, us to, to rethink uh, the purpose uh, and goal of uh, our, our existence itself. So from that point of view, if there is a divine disruption, let us make good use of that, being intelligent species uh, on this planet, and use this disruption for redesigning uh, academia and research and, and purpose for application to the betterment of both human uh, and other life forms on the planet and the nature itself, which has been exploited, overused, misused. And, and a situation has come where we are living under crisis. 
one thing that has happened recently is because of the pandemic and because of the lower level of vehicular and industrial uh, movements uh, the 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 environment is getting some kind of you know uh, respite and how can we continue to have that environmental respite uh, uh, synergy between the living beings and, and the environment and not degrade it to a level where such kind of episodes or such kind of pandemics keep on repeating again and again and again we want to avoid that so that means there is a warning uh, through this disruption by nature itself that start looking at nature to be your uh, ally and not just uh, exploit it a little as much as we have done Uh, with these words i once again congratulate all uh, organizers of this conference and i wish all the good luck to all participants and attendees and delegates and i hope that uh, the conference uh, is is uh, highly successful and comes out with some kind of uh, summary of the conference that is going to be useful for all of us thank you very much thank you so much sir we are so glad and delighted uh, to receive your valuable speech and to just add on this i just want to give uh, a brief information about uh, sir dr amitabh upadhyay who has over 30 years of experience in higher education and administration so uh, he has also published over 50 peer reviewed research papers book chapters and magazine articles and sits on editorial boards of several prestigious academic journals he is also associated as a visiting professor with several institutions around the world so he also awarded the academic leadership award by skyline university college in the year 2008 and education leadership award by the world sustainability congress in the year 2017 currently he is the professor and director of accreditation and outreach at Skyline University College in UAE. No, no, no. So much, uh, no, no, no. Skyline. I was there till September. Since September. okay, yeah. Okay. Currently, you are serving as a provost and vice president at American College of Dubai. Am I correct? Yes, yeah, yes, yes. Yes. Thank you so much for your valuable speech. And next, I would like to uh, invite our session chair, Miss Maria. to deliver this session chair speech hello hello everyone can you hear me can you see me clearly yes ma'am we can hear you all right can i share my screen uh, or you have to make me co-host or something i think i can share yes you can share directly okay lovely i'm not going to talk too much so uh first of all i would like to thank you for this invitation and for the for being uh, among uh, distinguished academic and researchers from all over the, the world and also um, uh, young researchers which is really very uh, important and interesting always to hear uh, their work and to disseminate the findings of their research um my name is dr maria stratopoulou i know that my surname is really very difficult so it is dr maria it's uh, absolutely fine um i was asked to say a few things uh, before the session as a session chair and i was thinking what um, what topic to choose what to talk about um before uh, saying this uh, brief uh, thoughts before explaining what i have in my mind i would like to thank a professor for the keynote speech normally the keynote speech in conferences are really boring but this one was not uh, at all and uh, he raised so many important thing uh things in his thought and that was um food for thought for all of us so he raised one very important issue which is really very uh, something we have to take into consideration all of us as researchers as teachers 
as academics, but also the young researchers. If this is something I'm always say to my students when they are coming to my office and say, hello, especially doctoral students, they are starting the research, they're starting their thesis. And they say, okay, uh, professor, what, uh, what, uh, what is your opinion about my subject? What would be my topic of my thesis of my doctoral uh, dissertation? And I always say, why? why you want to go for this topic, why you want to research. This is my area. I'm teaching research methodology in a university. I have teach in many universities in, the, um, in Europe, in Greece, Cyprus, the United Kingdom. I'm, uh, I, I studied in Belgium and I was researching many years there in the university, Catholic University of Leuven. So I have co um, co uh, cooperation and colleagues uh, from uh, all over uh, the world too. So we are always, uh, this, is the, this is something we are always say to our students, why? Why you want to do that? What is the problem that will really solve this uh, study? And what is the practical implication after that? Uh, how we are going to use these findings? Is, is it uh, any kind of use? Is there is any, uh, if it's not, if you cannot answer to this question, please don't start it come to my office only with a complete proposal of what you wanna do, what has been done in this area before, what is your idea and I can help you how to proceed. Okay, uh, Professor, you said um, that uh, that challenging times for researchers uh, give us the opportunity to become all of us very ex um, uh, advanced in technology, which is really, uh, but we didn't have any, any other chance. We didn't have any other option. We need to do it and we need to do it really Really, very, very fast. Uh, however, this specific at times was really challenging for uh, researchers and especially for doctoral students. I experienced that with my doctoral students. I experienced that with early year researchers in my universities. So we have impaired research. Um, during the pandemic, I was when this uh, all situation one year ago started, I was in the United Kingdom. Uh, there was there a big research about the challenging that the uh, researchers are facing. So uh, more than three quarters of the responders said that they have negative impact to their ability to collect the data, uh, to disseminate their ideas, their finding. It was so hard for them to continue with, uh, they have no access to laboratories. Uh, and even more than half of them, they have uh, problems with writing uh, their research. It's been almost a year. Uh, we have changed everything, the routines in our life. We have stress and worry about the future. And this is more um, obvious when you see uh, young researchers were trying to see what they're going to do in the future. They have problems with collecting the data, no access to schools, no access to families, no interviews, no one-to-one -one, um, interaction. Travels, uh, troubles with traveling, disseminating results. The conference, most of the conference, especially last year has to be even postponed or canceled. So they didn't have the opportunity to disseminate the results. And uh, plus uh, there is a high explosion in mental health problems in the general population. So many have seen months and even year of work disrupted, destroyed, because there was a closure of the laboratories. Others had field work and face to have face-to-face uh, -face training opportunities that have been canceled. Um, something I, I have to mention here, and I find it really very important, especially for the female um, researchers, those researchers or academics with children and other caring responsibilities were start to struggling with the reality because they cannot work at home while male peers around the world uh, seems to be getting ahead. So it was like more males were publishing, more males were uh, more free to focus on the work where the mothers had to be, have the mother role at home and cannot work. And university and funders must take some responsibility actually 
for helping the community and especially the community uh, of uh, researchers and academic to cope with this disruption in the future. Okay, we need to be optimistic and uh, we need to see the good things and keep on researching. I'm not gonna spend more of your time uh, now. Uh, I will uh, wish everyone uh, a successful and fruitful uh, experience in this uh, conference. And um, I will uh, close with the uh, wish that um, a conference is successful. Yes, as you said, when we continue this cooperation, when we, we, we will start um, meeting each other and we will probably think about future cooperations uh, between our universities. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Maria Ma'am, for your valuable speech, for delivering the session chair as well. So I would like to invite our next session chair, Ms. Micheline Benzini, to deliver a valuable session chair speech. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for the invite. So I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. So I'm going to share my screen also. Uh, so I'm Dr. Mushin Bijani, Assistant Professor of Engineering Sciences at the American University in Dubai. Um, so I've been asked to give a small speech about technological developments and modern trends in applied science and advanced engineering. So uh, for that, I'm going to discuss a little bit of nanomaterials and nanotechnology. I'm starting with this uh, picture over here. So you guys see ten a tennis racket. So you have nanocarbon. So now nanomaterial are actually something very important in industry and in research. So even tennis rackets are made stronger because of the nano, nanotubes. Or if you look at aerospace, for example. So the airplane in general, they were made of aluminum, for example, but now also they are made of carbon nanotube in addition to other nanocomposites. Uh, so this is a picture of nanotube. So the thing is, even in the textile, if we add, for example, some nanomaterial, what we can have in textile, we can put sensors, nanosensors, the textile could be UV protective, ultra strength. So you see very important properties that you might have only in nanomaterial. So I'm gonna show you this picture, for example, just one second. So this picture of gold, for example, here. So you see gold. If you look at it at the nanoscale, it has a different color. So this is just to show you, I'm not going through technicalities here, but this is just to show you that at the nanoscale material have different properties than at the macro scale. And I'll finish with this here for the nano material. So if you, for example, if you look at cancer cells, because nanomaterials are very important also for medicine. So for technology, for biotechnology. So if you see, for example, here, this is a cancer cell. In general, you put a drug, and this is how you treat the cancer. But with nanotechnology, what you can do, you can put a nano device, and this nano device, what, can, what it can do, it can image, detect, target, and report. So everything you can do with the nanotechnology. So uh, this is very important. So you can see that nanomaterials have impact not only on the industry, but also on our life in general. So, um, you know, in the future, who knows, maybe the lifespan would be extended to 500 years or 600 years. So this is all because of nanomaterial and nanotechnology. Um, so I'm just going to do a very brief um, history of nanomaterials. So something very important, though, to deal with nanomaterials. So, you know, Feynman is a very famous physicist. So in 1959, he said there is plenty of room at the bottom. So at the time he had not used the term nanoscale, but he was saying he has a futuristic vision about manipulating the atoms. So you see the atoms and the viruses. So this is just to see how small that is. So he has said, what if the encyclopedia was, for example, you can have it on the tip of a pin. And uh, so this was his futuristic, futuristic vision. But the term nano was first used by Norio Taniguchi from the Tokyo University in 1974. So when I talk about nano, 
just uh, a small thing. So, you know, nano, it used to mean something very small, but now when we talk about nano, so it's one over 10 to the power of nine. So this is how small the nano is. All right, so the thing is though, nanotechnology was not uh, realistic until we had the microscope invented in 1981. So you have atomic force microscope and scanning tunneling microscope. What can be done basically is not only see the atom, but manipulate the atoms. So you can see this picture here, this is IBM. This is individual green on atoms that spells out the word IBM. So this is why nanotechnology is now, uh, we, we can have nanotechnology. Uh, so for this picture below here, you can see these are zinc oxide. This is just a, Micro, micro, in, uh, a photo from the microscope. This was done at Texas Christian University. So I've worked with a group there in summer 2008. So you can see some of the morphologies of nanomaterial of zinc oxide. So I'm not gonna discuss this much. Um, so I'm just gonna say that zinc oxide, as in many nanomaterials and metal oxide nanomaterials, they have lots of applications in all uh, in biotechnology, whether it's in energy or optical engineering and communication, whether I talk also about cosmetics, about planes, so it has application to everything. And so the thing is about these zinc oxide or some other metal oxide, they are accessible. This is why it's important, so it's cheap to get them. And uh, as we said, when we talk about nanomaterials, they have unique properties. So they are even different, so better properties than the macro, so the, the material that you can see. So for zinc oxide, it's also biocompatible, biodegradable, and biosafe. Uh, now the thing is, the project, I'm discussing this project because it's about mechanism behind antibacterial properties. So you see here, it's a collaboration between, um, so that is Dr. Yuri Shremekhny in the School of Department of Physics, but also with the Department of Chemistry and the Department of Biology at the Texas Christian University. So I'm talking about this because as, the, as you mentioned previously, so it's all about collaboration. So I'm not gonna talk about uh, the research that was done. So there is a research that was done with the physics department. So you can see this big machine that was used to characterize the zinc oxide material. So I'm not gonna go in the detail of that, but also there is collaboration with the biology and the chemistry department as well. And then from there, we got our conclusion. So if there is no collaboration, it's not really easy to have uh, good results. Uh, so my final conclusion for this talk, uh, for advancement in any field, as you have mentioned also previously, we have to bridge the gap between basic and applied research. And what's more important is cooperation between private, public, universities and industries and so on. And of course, you have to also collaborate between all different departments. So for example, chemistry, physics, material science, biology, engineering. So different departments, if they work together, then uh, we can actually get to the real industrial revolution that we might get with the nanotechnology. So for now, we're still, there are some innovation with nanotechnology, but we're not really at the huge revolution, but it could happen if there is collaboration between uh, all of the different entities. Uh, so thank you. This is my small presentation and good luck to everybody. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Pichelin, ma'am, for delivering the session chair speech. Next, uh, coming to the technical sessions. Next, I welcome all the participants to the respective technical sessions. First, I would like to invite Ms. Maria to present her paper titled Parental Stress and Children Self-Regulation Problem in Families with Non-verbal children with development disabilities. Ms. Maria, ma'am, you can, uh, can start the presentation. Okay, I'm trying to uh, share my screen. All right, can you see my screen? That's good. So uh, my uh, presentation 
will be on uh, something I'm, I'm really interested in the last uh, years. Uh, as my research- Ma'am, uh, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, your screen is not visible. My screen is not visible, sorry. No. Sorry, I need to, yeah, not your, sorry. You cannot now see- Now it's visible. Now it's visible, yes. Now it's, it is? It yes. is visible? It's okay. All yes. right. All right. Let me uh, leave it like this and I will change it because it is interactive and I think there is a problem with the multimedia in the screen. Okay. So I was telling that this is my area. So um, this is, uh, I will present you a, a research I, I did with uh, two different universities um, the last year, which was a very difficult year for everyone and uh, has to do with the parental stress. So the stress that the families are experiencing when they have a child uh, with developmental disabilities and autism. Okay, uh, is that okay? Can you see my screen now? I think it was with the first slide, the problem. Can you see my screen? Yes, ma'am, it's visible, All yes. Right. So um, I, I am uh, author of uh, actually five books at the moment, books at the moment, but these are the most relevant books which has to do with uh, autism. So um, I, I was exploring and I am exploring uh, the area of uh, the enigma of autism, meaning what is uh, behind the disorder. And I, we, all of us who are researching the area, we need to uh, reply to uh, this question. And this is something that they're always asking me when I'm going to present my book to um, teachers or professionals or even uh, parents who have children in the spectrum. So um, is it genius, a child with uh, autism? Is it a disorder actually? Or there are just different, all these people that there have an official diagnosis of autism. So uh, if you ask me after so many years working and researching in the area, I am not, I cannot say for sure uh, if it is, uh, because we have children, we are really very genius, we are really very um, highly intelligent, and they are in a specific areas like maths. Uh, uh, we have children that there are uh, experiencing a lot of problems, so there, you can say that there is a condition, there is a disorder, as the daily life is really interrupted and disrupt. And uh, I, I certainly say that Children and adults uh, who, are, who are in the spectrum, uh, who are autistic, are different, definitely different. So they experience the world in a different way. So if you ask me, I'm not saying that this is a disability, this is a disorder, but it is a different way of seeing things. Dr. Maria. So what, what, yes. Thank you very much. Your, your topic is very interesting. But is there is any definition, general definition for the autism? Yes, yeah. definitely. Okay, autism is a spectrum. So we can see that it is an umbrella term under the developmental disability and developmental disorders. So uh, uh, because it is a spectrum, um, has two poles, meaning that we have children that are really um, they are verbal, they have some only some communication issues, problems with interacting, not having friendships. So it's not very obvious to see that there are uh, autistic. And on the other hand, there are also autistic children that they are not verbal, they cannot talk, and uh, they have a lot of sensory problems. They cannot hear loud sounds. They cannot have an eye contact, so they cannot see you in the eyes. They cannot interact. They have a lot of behavior and challenging behaviors. Uh, so it's really very hard for them. Uh, and I cannot, I cannot discuss about what is to be the mic. Is it possible because there are a lot of background sounds? Okay, thank you very much. All right, all of you. Um, 
I request everyone to please mute. Sorry, uh, can, you, uh, can you please mute? I think there are some participants that haven't muted their microphones and there are. Yes, ma'am. I informed them. You can continue. I'm sorry for the interruption. All right. No worries. All right. So, um, I, I, I would like to talk and uh, I would talk for uh, days if you ask, uh, leave me. I, however, I am going to focus on this specific uh, research, uh, which uh, focusing on families who have a child, at least one child in the spectrum. So uh, autism is, is, is a huge topic. And the fact that the last years we have more and more uh, cases uh, and more and more official diagnosis, even in, in, uh, in la later in life. So there are cases of um, adults uh, that are diagnosed uh, around 30 or 40 years of uh, age. And uh, then they start having a meaning all this um, behavior they have. Um, however, there are very uh, there are many cases of children in the spectrum that there are really severe and they have no verbal skills and the families are experiencing uh, highly stress, as you can imagine. So the aim of this study was to investigate the relationship between the self-regulation skills of these children, how they can regulate their emotions, how they can regulate their behavior, and the parental stress in the families of children with nonverbal children, okay? Families that they have children, that they have uh, at least one child in the spectrum, but nonverbal. Okay. So uh, about the method we use, we uh, use the parenting stress index um, questionnaire uh, and uh, our sample was 75 families who have an official diagnosis of their uh, of uh, autism for at least one of their children. Um, about the children, we ask teachers and professionals professionals in education to rate the children in a self-regulation score on the motor behavior checklist, which is a checklist um, I, with my team, uh, developed in uh, 2012. Uh, the original version is in English. However, there are, at the moment, seven uh, different translation of the instrument. And uh, at the moment, we are currently uh, developing the Arabic a version of this uh, motor behavior checklist, which is actually an assessment instrument for teachers, practitioners, experts in education, professionals who uh, are rating the behavior of the child, just observing the child. In addition to that, we uh, select a focus group of six parents, four mothers and two uh, fathers, and we have uh, in deep interviews with them to give us uh, more of their experience uh, living and uh, trying to deal with this uh, situation and these behaviors. What about the results? I'm not going to give you all these uh, tables and figures we, we, we have uh, produced doing all this analysis, uh, but I will uh, stress uh, the point, the, the importance of the result to, um, to, to two or three uh, different uh, findings. So one of these that the correlation analysis we did revealed that the parenting stress was posi posi positively correlated, was positively correlated with elevated scores on MBC children's self-regulation subscales, which is mean that uh, if the children has more problems in self-regulating their feelings, their behaviors, so the parental stress were 
was uh, higher. On the other hand, parenting stress was negatively correlated with the social function support reported by the mothers. What this means, this means that when we are actually asking the mothers, do you have any kind of support, any kind of financial or social support? What is your defense mechanism? What are the help you have from the society, from friends, from the community, from organizations, I don't know. So they describe that the families that they really have some kind of um, important support and functional support, uh, the parental stress were, was lower. Uh, finally, we collect some qualitative data, analyzing transcript from the interviews and this uh, analyzing uh, and these results revealed an additional stressors for families and uh, parents recommendation to help them with uh, this uh, stress. So uh, I will uh, give you some examples from uh, the interviews that, that were really very interesting in some of the cases. Uh, I don't know if any of you have uh, um, experience by doing interviews, uh, which is uh, something I, I was not using in the past. I was doing more uh, quantitative research uh, using score and statistics. However, I found uh, the qualitative data, the selection of qualitative data, especially through interviews and focus group, really very interesting uh, in giving us uh, more detail and more information especially in perception, um, emotion, and feelings. So uh, the official diagnosis had uh, about negative emotion of shock, blame, denial, depression, leaving parents overwhelmed with the situation. So one of our participants, Lisa, said, I want to use severe depression. I get panic attacked. I was thinking to hurt myself father who was a doctor and when we are start discussing he start crying and say can you stop recording please the interview because i want to share with you some things that are really happening i i i i need to say something at this point, especially for the young researcher. There are many ethical issues when you're doing interviews, when you're sharing your results. We cannot do anything for um, the research sake. Okay, we cannot reveal anything. Yes, we are using uh, pseudonymous. We are not using the real names. Yes, we try to protect our participants. Yes, we are taking constant forms from our participants, but we need to uh, think uh, not only as researchers, but also as people, as um, as humans and see, uh, especially for sensitive data, we need to be really uh sure that we are not uh, expose our uh, participants and uh, their experiences so uh, parents felt revealed especially when they uh, have the official diagnosis for their uh, children and they could start having um, sense about what was happening lisa explained i did really feel relieved i, I know this is not just a naughty boy and the realization that parents were not blamed was liberating so there are some different stage in the experience of the parents when they're having this diagnosis for the first time first of all it was it is a shock so they cannot uh, believe it especially if the child is verbal there are no um, there are some signs of developmental disability however it's not so obvious that there is a problem so when they are hearing that your ch child ha it has autism it's like oh my god what i'm gonna do but the, when they are uh, start uh thinking again and again uh then uh, all the um all the behavior of the child has a meaning which is really very liberating and they are not feeling guilt about uh bad parenting or uh, it's not their fault 
So in addition, they are talking, they, they told us about the demands of having a child uh, in the family and how this can um, affect the, the relationship in the couple, which was really very interesting. Initially, we were to blame each other. This is the second, uh, generally, this is the second step. First, it is a shock. Then the, the, the couple start blaming each other and say, oh my God, I was blaming myself. The, the whole family was dysfunctional. You're blaming your husband. He's blaming my, uh, my side, my family. Uh, it's your fault. It's, it's not my fault. It's you. You are not a good uh, parent and things like that. So uh, especially the time they invest to help to support the child, it's so huge that they there is no time for the couple to uh, be together. So uh, when we are asking them about the stress, the body pain, the confused brain, they, they say, I feel a lot of stress, a body pain, confused brain. I always feel uh, guilty without, uh, for not um, uh, be with the other children, with the other, uh, the youngest children, because I'm always focusing on the, uh, on the child with the disability. I feel I'm running every single day from five to eight. I do not stop, no break until I fall down by tiredness. All of these uh, experiences are really very important and very um difficult for them to handle. So findings reveal um, findings reveal uh, that, uh, let me check here, uh, that each developmental disability uh, was due to its unique behavioral characteristic uh, and has to do with the anxiety. Uh, and so it was the parents' perception what of the actual disability, especially as regard to uh, autism spectrum disorder. The problematic behaviors included physical aggression, self-injury, um, stereotype behaviors, tantrums, and um, crisis uh, with uh, behavior crisis. As a result, children with ADASD are often highly disrupted in the classroom. So uh, reported by teacher that I, I cannot uh, handle the situation with your child. This is also a stressor for the family and the parents. All of these behaviors have been directly uh, related to parental stress. So uh, uh, in the discussion of this paper, we are aiming at developing strategies because we said that, okay, we are doing research, but why we are doing that? Because we need to have some kind of tips, of strategies, of practical implication, and how we are going to support this uh, parent. We collect this data, we know the problem. So what? and what we are doing from uh, that point. So uh, in our discussion, uh, we are aiming to develop, we are developing some strategies actually to improve self-regulation skills in nonverbal children, because we found that when the children cannot regulate their feelings, cannot regulate their behavior, they cannot communicate as they are nonverbal, they cannot communicate their needs, so I'm thirsty, I'm cold, um, I, I want to sleep or I wanna, I'm hungry. This very simple um, need has to be learned how to communicate. This will uh, make them uh, have no uh, crisis in behavior and aggressive behavior because um, the reason, the cause for many aggressive behavior is um, the situation of um, not be able to communicate uh, their own um, their own needs. So uh, we will uh, we we found some good um, strategies and we share it uh, with the parents. And uh, from the interviews also we wrote and we note and we are analyzing a number of suggestions 
for social support and uh, protective factors. Some of the protective factors were also uh, religion. Uh, some of them, they say, yes, I found some peace and some hope in the religion or uh, in, in families, in uh, um, significant others. So we uh, record and analyze all these suggestions and we are giving some good uh, advice and strategies. First, how to improve the self-regulation skills of children and secondly, and most importantly, to support uh, parents and uh, help them overcome this stressful situation. So thank you very much for uh, listening to my uh, study. I'm, I'm really happy if uh, anyone would like to, I, I can share my email uh, through the conference administration or uh, and uh, I will be really happy to receive uh, any kind of question now or later individually in my mail. And I will really uh, take the opportunity to say that as we are doing now the Arabic version of the MBC, that will be really a good if anyone is interested in the field to co collaborate in a future research or uh, publication. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, ma'am, for your valuable presentation. If any queries, proceed. Okay. Next, I would like to invite Mr. Majid Al Khindi to present his paper with the title The Relevance of Culture Affecting Generation Y Consumers on Brand Equity in Dubai, the Integration of Social Media Advertising. Mr. Majid. Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank much. You so much sir. Yeah, my name is Dr. Majid Al Kindi. I am from Adana University, in Dubai. I'm from Iraq, and I'm glad to be here. It's my honor to be in this uh, conference, and I am very happy with the first lecture from Dr. Maria. I think her name. She get a lot for my because I have uh, my, one of my kids is autism, and I hope yeah, and I hope in the future you will work about. Uh, Something called body language. You didn't confirm it. Body language is very important for those autism. So sometimes by eyes, by hands, by, they will understand what you want from them, especially the parents. I hope in the future you'll do a book about body language to be easier for the parents or for his brothers, sisters to connect with. Because as you see, and as I read it too much, they are mm -hmm. reading images. Now I will change from this side to other side about culture. Culture, yes, culture, what we have. Uh, uh, since I was in Singapore and then I was in Malaysia, I, I, I'm, I'm starting, uh, I will share. Did, did you see, see? Did you, can, can you see my sharing? Yes, sir. Very yes, good. Sir. Yeah. <clears throat> so when I was in Singapore, Malaysia and these areas, I start to, to, to study the culture since 2011, then I would like to see what kind of culture we have and how can we deal with this culture? How can we deal with the brand and brand equity? So I make this, uh, this uh, article and uh, it has a novelty because uh, as we see that we are living in digital area and uh, uh, this revolution is something, uh, uh, the last 10 years has changed the whole face of the world. So let us go and see what we have here. The, 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 the title of my article is The Relevance of Culture Affecting Genuine Consumers on Brand Equity in Dubai. Why I'm taking Dubai? Dubai because uh, it's a global city and it has more than 208 nationalities. So this is the, 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 the reason why I'm taking Dubai to make my article as an international as in the world. So. Here we are, uh, we speak about the world has been moved towards the fourth industrial revolution. So this communication, new technology, et cetera, et cetera. It is the fourth revolution industrial and it has brought them back to Gene Y adoption. So uh, when they ask uh, who's Gene Y, Gene Y is the generation Y who start, I'm born from 1977 till 1999. Those generation they are born and their computers are in their hands so they start their 
first learning with computers. I'm not speak about generation Z or generation, the other generation after Z. I'm speaking about generation Y who are living with the computers, starting the steps of the computer. So he's gradually study and have his education by, uh, let us say by computer, but not our age as like me and Dr. Maria. Anyhow, so those generation one and social media advertising on a brand, uh, so, sorry, 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 sorry. So it is the, the topic speak about this research speak about examining the exploratory culture as a moderator with Gene Y and as a mediator with social media in brand equity or brand equity. So it is double. This article speak about mediator and moderator to see if there is gap here or there to cover it from all. Then <clears throat> the introduction, uh, why I'm taking United Arab Emirates. In uh, United Arab Emirates, uh, the last 30 years have um, an emerging Arab company that tried to adapt the Western development. And this is a unique uh, example. What we see, if you see Dubai before uh, 25 years is not as like today, Dubai. Dubai is changing 180 degree. It's take the, 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 the whole, what have it in, 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 in Western, well, uh, development, but it is still as like a, a spirit of the East. You can smell that the Islamic way or what the, the, the tradition there, even from the samples of the building. So they took two things, culture and modern with a new style of life. And I hope in the future they have a new ideas, even a new phenomenon in, 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 in residency, in, 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 in every direction in life you can go there and you see any something i do not like say it's a fancy city but i would like to say it's an opportunity to have an idea about how you live the next 10 or 20 or 20 or year because it's a model what is a new life it will come so whatever i have we can do it here in dubai and we can start to 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 let the other arab homeland to see that so Dubai has entered the global marketplace and even education, Dubai has, and we, as we can see that I am from Dubai, Dr. Maria from United Arab Emirates. So even we have a uh, diversity of uh, professors. We, 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 one of my friends, he make an article about this issue and he found that there is 134 different nationalities taught inside Dubai. See how can, they affect the culture inside Dubai or inside United Arab Emirates. Then uh, I'm going to, to, to speak about social media. So if you will go to a de a definition about what is social media advertising. So it is available means that the capture of interest of this uh, lecture market uh, segment. This is uh, just a little old, 2012, because as I said before, I, I'm starting interesting on this issue since 2011. So whatever we can hear, uh, we have application for Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, etc., etc., etc. There is many application. This cut the whole world in one piece that I can connect, and even I can, they know from where I am. And where is I'm even I'm not, if I'm driving or at my home or my college, etc., 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 etc. Those make the companies interesting. Um, how to 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 see to evaluate to catch their behavior. So even today, when you are even if you'd like to speak about something, let us speak about cars or let us speak about uh, new models of phones, etc. When you start to open Google or you start to open your site, you can find that whatever you say, it is inside Google. And sometimes, why it's happened that? How can it happen that? What is the reason I'm speaking just like that? Who's watching me after? So uh, before 10 years or 15 years, we are connected to internet. But today, unfortunately, we are not. We are living inside the internet. And this is what will happen with me and with the other staff now we are living inside the internet that we are one part of this internet and this mobile, it is not mobile. It is our, some of my friends say that this is the bodyguards. It is not the bodyguards. We are living inside this one. We are not handled this one. We are living inside this one because if we left it, we are not us. We are something else. 
we are returned to something else. And this is next my my next article. So uh, after that, uh, I took uh, there is two idea about culture. This is Hofstadt model. Hofstadt model is a theory, and so it have five dimension. Is to check what is inside of this human as a behavior. If he would like to interest in social media or a brand, what is kind of this interesting? So I support, and there, and there is someone else called Sherma. And unfortunately, it is not inside the focus. Sherma is the best who define culture and who update Hofstad model. I hope from the your researcher or other researcher, if they would like to speak about culture, let go and update their Hofstad model to Sherma. Sherma is to, uh, he have an article in 2009 or 2010, and he update the five dimension of culture of uh, model culture of Hofstad to 10 dimension. And it will cover everything, whatever you need inside. So already I adapt Hofstad, but little update from Sherma to support my uh, article here. And then after that, uh, if we if we define what is a brand equity, there is no define for brand equity. There is many different idea about brand equity. How can we define it? And we are starting to today. We do not have any define for the brand. What is a brand? Brand. It's a, the, the, the name of the company, or it's the logo, or whatever, or it's the quality, or the return to the, the last 19s. There is a model called Acre model, and he make. Uh, uh, four definitions for brand equity. One of them, it's uh, the, 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 the quality, the, the other things is the, the, something else about the association, the other things is about the loyalty, the awareness. So today, do we have all this dimension to know what kind of brand we have it? Do we see the, the quality of the brand? Do we see the what calling the, 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 uh, the, we are loyal to this brand because they're advertising or we have awareness to understand what kind of mobile we have and what kind of brand or what kind of whatever brand we have as like a, I'm giving a mobile as an example. So uh, when our kids like to jump to an Apple, they do know they have an idea about what what is Apple, why they go after it, why they like it more than the other uh, uh, brand, Samsung, when I will go to Malaysia or Singapore or this West or China, do I think the Huawei or Apple or uh, Samsung? I'm speaking about only brands uh, and it is different age. Uh, I'm giving this brand as uh, an example. And what is the relation with social media? What kind of social media we have that it, it, it is, I, I, I will not say effect, it will attack. It's attack our brain then first our heart so they are starting to let us believe i do not like to return to goebbels in 1940s in the second world lie 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 then will, you will uh, uh, believe that it is not it is truth no but i'm i'm starting about what what is competition between those companies uh, if they attack from the social media and they believe and all of that what is culture doing inside this issue? Culture, we are believe in, in, in our tradition are returned to our families, parents, grandfather to believe on that one or believe in this one, or uh, I mean the brands. So the new generation, do they believe about our beliefs or not? And this is why I'm taking as this uh, a theoretical framework is just a little difficult but uh, I, I will try to, to, to make a symbol. So I'm taking culture and social media uh, directly to generation one attitude and on brand equity. So you can see there is nine hypotheses and this nine hypotheses, all of it, I examine it. I make investigation about this all. So directly or indirectly, I'm going to be as like a moderator here, direct moderator or a mediator from the red one. So culture, I can use it as a moderator and as a mediator. And this is, I think it is the first uh, study inside UAE or Middle East as used uh, culture moderator and mediator. And then after that, 
The methodology, as you know that Dubai is a wide mix of religion, cultures, etc. That's give me an, a, a good idea how to make a, those people, how to, 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 should I make it as a nationalities? If I'll go as a nationalities, it will, um, this uh, topic will never end after one year, two years. Or should I take it as an area? So better for me to take it as an area. So I take it as four dimension as like uh, Asian or Asian or Western. Uh, and then I take North and South and Arab area. So it will be easy to control it as like dimension of culture. And there here, this is the result what I saw. This is, uh, you can see it clearly or difficult. Can I, let me allow it over? You can see it, the numbers? Yes, sir, it's visible. Yeah, that's good. That's oh, good. it's visible, sir. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 so this is uh, what they call it, uh, social media. And uh, by the way, this is the mobile. So, and I'm speaking about mobile, not mobile phone, uh, mobile, whatever, computer, etc., etc., etc. So, social media advertising, how can it affect the brand equity and then culture, the relation with culture, social media, and the relation with attitude. And then from the attitude, how can brand equity? So you can see from here, the relation, and you can see that culture, the high marks with social media, also the high, but here it is less, depends on what kind of it. Let us see later what we will have. And then, and then here we have, I put it two dimension, less culture and client culture. So when we have, we got into this model explaining the moderating effect of culture or less culture in a client and most culture in a client of the re relationship between social media advertising and genuine attitude on brand equity. We can see that here it will be more better and more clearly. That means less culture in a client are more powerfully than who have culture as like Arab, because as you see that Arab are, we are belong to our culture more than the others. And uh, I, I found that um, some nationalities of Arab, they are stick, whatever their family said, but mostly, and this is the percentage is just around 17 percentage from the hundred, around 87 percent or 88, let us say 88, they are less culturally inside own brand. That means given as a result, and this is the aim to examine, as I said, the explore the influence of culture of genuine own brand equity among social media advertising, further study genuine as a mediator on brand equity among culture and social media advertising. This is study discover that genuine attitude towards the brand equity increase among producers who are less culturally. That means those who are uh, born from, let us say, let us on the end of 1980 is still 1999 are less culturally than the other, who, uh, more cu less culturally than the others, that means who believe in computer, they are not believe in their families and their tradition. They are believe in advertising. And this is given an idea that in the future, we are not believe in our tradition as we believe computer would say. And this is very risky that computer is, there is another controller behind it who change the mood. And this is, we can, Use it by Dr. Maria that computers can change everything, can change mind, can change belief, can change standardization, and can change principles if the people behind it is more aggressive to change the traditions of culture. And I hope in the future, and we can see, and next my article is about the risk of video games in, uh, in front of children, especially in the Middle East because we see many society has effect from this risky, especially in Egypt, Iraq, Syria, and other countries here, Middle East. And finally, I would like to thank all the staff here. I would like to thank my colleague and thank you very much. I hope that I have just a limit and do not make headache to you. Thank you very much. God bless you.
Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much for your valuable speech. If any queries, session chairs can proceed with the queries, else we can go with the next presentation. Okay. Next. Next, I would like to call upon uh, Ms. Micheline to present her paper with the title of Optical Properties of MGO Thin Films Deposited on GOO2 and SAO2 Substracts. All right, hello again. Thank you so much, ma'am. You can proceed with the presentation. So my presentation is very different than the previous one. Uh, let me, so I'm going to be discussing, as you said, the optical properties of magnesium oxide, thin fin, deposited on germanium oxide and silicon O2 substrate. Uh, so this work was done by myself, uh, Dr. Aisha Four and Dr. Farid Slissi uh, from the Higher Colleges of Technology. Uh, so this is a theoretical study, not experimental. Uh, so I'm discussing MgO nanostructure, magnesium oxide. So I've discussed briefly in my first presentation, zinc oxide. So MgO is an, another metal oxide nanostructure that is very important. So some of the properties, good properties about it, it, it has a wide bend gap. It has good chemical and thermal stability. It's also uh, economical stable. It's very cheap. We can get it easily and it is uh, eco-friendly. So for MGO, it also has lots of applications. So as we said, many metal oxide nanostructure have many applications, including medical, uh, cancer treatment, biomedical, as well as environmental, as well as optical and optoelectronic applications. Uh, so for this presentation, I'm discussing mostly the optical and optoelectronic application of the MGO nanostructure. So, as I said, this is a, a theoretical work. So we want to check if we have a thin film of MGO, what will be its ideal thickness? And this thin film will be put on a substrate, either germanium O2 and or silicon O2. So this is what will be discussed uh, theoretically. All right, so if you look at this figure over here, this is the film of MGO. It has an index of refraction N. You have the air over here and zero equal to one. This is the substrate. As you said, it's either germanium O2 or silicon O2. And the substrate has index of refraction of S. So you have a normal incidence. So you have an incident light that comes upon the film. Some of the light will be reflected, some will be transmitted. So R1 is the intensity of the reflected light on the interface between air and film. R2 is the intensity of reflected light on the interface between the film and the substrate. And as for the reflection at the interface between substrate and air, we're not considered that for this work. Uh, so what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna put some equation of reflectance and trans transmittance of the thin film. And then uh, the work is gonna be simulated using MATLAB. All right, so these are some equations over here. I'm gonna go back to the equations when I, once I put the graph. So if I look at the index of the thin film, so MGO, so this is an approximation, but a very good one for N as function of lambda, where lambda is the wavelength of light. So these A and B and C, these are constants. Uh, the values will be shown in the next slide. Uh, for the refractive index of, of the substrate, so uh, germanium O2 and silicon O2, there is this equation that will be used. Again, A1, lambda 1, A2, lambda 2, A3, and lambda 3 are constant. And lambda is the wavelength of light. Uh, I'm going to be using also a couple of more equations, extinction coefficients. So you can see how it changes with lambda, the wavelength. The absorption coefficient, alpha, so it's related to K and lambda. There is R1 and R2 that are called the reflectance. So again, these are the equation as function of N and S, the index of uh, refraction, and you see over here as well. The, finally, we have the transmittance. So I'm very, we, what's interesting is we wanna see when do you get maximum transmittance, for example. 
So uh, T is equal to T0. This is the transmittance uh, with interference effect and without interference effect. So I'm going to revisit these equations uh, when I discuss the graph. All right, so this is the first uh, graph. This is the refractive index. You can see over here the refractive index as function as of the wavelength. So again, for MGO, there was this equation that was used. As you said, A, B, and C are constant as given over here. Lambda is the wavelength of light. So it is observed between 0.3 and 0.8. You can see how the refractive index is decreasing exponentially. And after that, it becomes almost linear. So this is for MGO as function of the wavelength. A couple of more graphs are the refractive indices of germanium O2 and silicon O2 using this equation over here. So these were plotted using MATLAB. A1, A2, A3, these are the constants for each material and you can get these, and we get these graphs here. Uh, so again, you see an exponential decrease until finally it's almost linear at the end. So these are for the refractive indices of germanium O2 and silicon O2. Uh, for the extinction coefficient and absorption coefficient, so this is according to this equation, again, we're checking how it changes with lambda. So you can see again, an exponential decrease between 0 0.3 and 0 0.7. And then at the end, you see it's almost constant with a very, very small value. Uh, for the absorption coefficient, this is how it changes with lambda. Uh, so at the end, it becomes almost zero. So it becomes almost zero at higher wavelengths. And this is because we have very small absorption of um, MGO in the visible and near infrared light. Um, now we get to the transmi transmission spectra. So without interference, so this was the term T0 and T0, we got it from this equation over here, if you see here. This is how we got T0. So this is what has been plotted here. Uh, the, transmission, the transmittance as function of the wavelength. And we're trying to find what is the ideal thickness uh, to use. So this is, we have used different thicknesses of MGO. And we're saying the transmission spectra without the interference effect. This is on germanium O2. And this is the, transmission, the transmittance on silicon O2. Now, if we look at the transmission with a transmission with interference effect, so here we go, with interference effect, so it's T minus T0. This delta here is equal to this. So again, function of the wavelength. And you can see there are lots of maxima and minima. So the reason for that is because we have multiple reflection of light between the top surface of the film and the bottom surf surface of the film that is in contact with the surface, with the substrate. So for that reason, we have these uh, peaks, maxima and minima. All right, and um, the last graph here, if I look at the transmission spectra deposited on silicon O2 and germanium O2, so this is what we get over here. So this is important because you can see if you have a thickness of about 20, 0 0.20 micrometers, you get very high transmittance between 70 and 80%. So you can see this triangle here, the graph with triangle. This is for a thickness of 0 0.20 micrometers. So you have very high transmittance for wavelengths between 0 0.8 and about 1.1. Whether I'm discussing the silicon O2 or the germanium O2. Uh, so finally, we can say that optical properties have been discussed for different film thicknesses. And so if we have a film thickness of 0 0.20 micrometer deposited on either germanium O2 or silicon O2 substrate, we're gonna have very, very high transmittance uh, when the wavelengths range between 0 0.8 and 1.1 uh, micrometer. So this is important because uh, we can actually do experimental work and try to do thin films of 0 0.20 micrometer of MGO 
to get high transmittance, which will aid in application in optoelectronics devices. All right, thank you. If you have any questions. Thank you so much, ma'am, for your valuable presentation. Next, we will go to the next presenter, Mr. Nagharasan Ramesh will present his paper with the title of Effect of Different Solvent System on Oil Extraction from Immobilized micro lake Cells of Cholera Vulgaris, Kinetic and Demodynamic Studies. Good morning, sir. Uh, can yes, start uh, good morning. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Wait, let me share my slides. Yes. All right. So, can you all share my? Uh, can you all see my slides? Yes, it's visible. Ah, all right. Thank you. So, let me start. All right. Good day, everyone, to the organizers and all the keynote speaker and also our fellow presenter today. So, I'm Nagarasan Ramesh from Malaysia. So today I'd like to share about my or share or present about my article paper, which is effect of different solvent systems on oil extraction from immobilized microalgae cells of coral algaris, kinetic and thermodynamic studies. So uh, anyway. all right. So basically, I'm the main author, and I got some Ramesh. I'm a student of UMP, University of Malaysia Pahang, Malaysia, and doing my Masters of Science. And the corresponding other is Dr. Idaya Mat Yasin, a senior lecturer and also the research leader for this particular research. So I proceed to my article paper then. So I start with abstract. So the main focus of this research article is on on oil extraction from immobilized microalgae, which is Corella vargaris. So another objective is to study the kinetic and thermodynamics of oil extraction using different solvent systems. So we started the research uh, with microalgae cultivation, immobilization of microalgae, and harvesting the immobilized beads to obtain the microalgae biomass. Then we proceed with oil extraction using different solvent systems such as aptin, heptin mixed with methanol and heptin mixed with ethanol, ethanol. Then the extracted oil is transesterified and analyzed for fatty acid methyl ester, which is to identify the composition of biodiesel. So from the calculation, from the experimental work, we, uh, we know that the, we, we know that aptin is achieved the highest uh, oil yield, which is 27.42 percentage at the highest temperature and longer extraction time, which is I will be explaining later. And the kinetic values also increase as the temperature and also the activation of the process is known to be 89.06 kilojoule per mole. So from here, from the from the oil extraction, the the oil has yielded. Um, five types of fatty acids, which is palmitic, steric, oleic, linoleic, and linolenic acids. Using our gas chromatography and mass spectrometry analysis, which is indicates that quality biodiesel. So in detail, I'll explain on my next slides. So as we introduction, the main idea of this research or this research paper is to produce biodiesel. So there are lots of, or there are many of the generations for feedstock for biodiesel production. So among these feedstocks, microalgae for past decades, for past two to three decades, can be considered as a promising raw material, and it is called third generation feedstock to produce biodiesel. Why we need bio, uh, biodiesel for uh, microalgae is because it has no competition between the demand of food and also demand of fuel. So which, me which makes the microalgae can be the best or uh, the potential feedstock for the future biodiesel production. So particularly by, uh, there are many sources or may, uh, many species of microalgae. In this research article, we only talk about microalgae species, which is Chlorella vargaris, because um, it is the ace choice for the biodiesel, uh, biofuel industry, thanks to its high growth rate, easy cultivation, 
in different culture mediums and the less risk of contamination and producing good quality biodiesel. So that's why we choose Corella vargaris as our microalgae species for this particular uh, research. So despite having many positive notes, the major drawback for microalgae convert into biodiesel is the separation of microalgae from its growth medium. So um, usually or traditionally centrifugation Coagulation and membrane filtration are the predominant choices for microalgae separation. So the separation meanings over here is a dewatering process, which means to produce the algae biomass. Producing the algae biomass. So uh, consuming uh, the, the mention the mentioned processes such as centrifugation coagulation and membrane filtration are consuming larger energy economically expensive and larger retention and a uh, larger retention time so this means this means these processes are not really feasible for the industry for the industrial in terms of lab scale it is really okay but then we when we want to scale up from the lab to industry, it is really not feasible uh, despite, uh, despite having many advantages. So for that, the researchers, the current and also this current research have introduced the immobilization technique or method for microalgae uh, harvesting as an alternative for usual separation methods. Then another vital stage of converting microalgae into biodiesel is oil extraction process. So the basically the previously uh, for the oil extraction concept we use expeller press press extraction hydraulic press supercritic supercritical fluid extraction and also ultrasonic assisted extraction but due to the op higher operating cost we have chosen the solvent extraction method which is a common technique and also low operating cost compared to other extraction methods and also this method has a high transfer rate of soluble particle from a solid to liquid state so thus in this particular research we have chose a solvent extraction method to extract the oil from immobilized microalgae to produce biodiesel and then for the solvent extraction method the solvent system as the highest influence in terms of yield of oil extraction, composition, and quality of the oil. So the great attributes such as higher stability, being a less corrosive substance, suitable boiling point range, and market availability make the industrial prefer axing for lipid extraction or oil extraction. But due to the toxic solvent and environmentally not free to use, uh, we have chose heptin as a non-polar solvent to extract the oil from the immobilized microalgae. So basically, throughout this research paper, we will discuss about the extraction process using different solvent systems such as heptin, heptin mixed with methanol, axin mixed with ethanol to, to extract the oil from immobilized microalgae. So these are the research objectives. Not stopping at oil yield, we also evaluate the kinetic and thermodynamics of oil extraction, how it changes the effect of solvents, how it effect on kinetics and also the thermodynamics. So we're going to investigate on me, which is I'm going to discuss it later on. And then the novel approach of this research is application of immobilization method for the microalgae harvesting. So these are the methodology experimental work. We started with preparation of Torella Vargari stock and we started to prepare the immobilized beads and once we have uh, get a proper or uh, matured immobilized beads, we will harvesting using a uh, simple drying method to, to get a powder from biomass. Once we get the biomass, we will start our oil extraction with a condition of five hour extraction time with an interval of one hour. And we have deferred the temperature from 45 to 75 degrees Celsius to differentiate the, to study the effect of temperature also. At the same time, we use three types of uh, solvent system, which is heptin, heptin methanol, heptin ethanol. So from there, we will study the kinetics and thermodynamics. And then the expected oil will be transesterified, as I mentioned earlier. We use acid catalyzed 
uh, trans acerbation process uh, and then we will send for the gas chromatography mass spectrography analysis for the study of fatty acid methyl ester profiles. Are you all with me? Can you all hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Uh, yeah, just to check because it's a uh, not common method, right? The virtual presentation. So I'm just checking. <laughs> All right, so let's come to the results and discussion. So for the part A, I have studied the effect of solvents and amount of oil extraction. So as we can see from the table over here, as the extraction time and also extraction temperature increases, we can notice that the yield of oil extraction also increases for every solvent, you know, uh, starting with heptane, heptane methanol, and also heptane ethanol. So from there, we can analyze that uh, heptane achieved the highest oil oil yield, which is 27.42 percentage at the highest temperature. This is because heptane is considered as a non-polar sol non solvent and also it has low viscosity and low polarity. But when we mix with the alcohol, which is a polar group, it reduces the chemical properties of heptane towards the efficiency to extract the oil from the as microalgae. So thus, from in terms of amount of oil, heptane is the best and suitable solvent can be used for, for, for the oil extraction. The next thing is effect of solvent on reaction rate constant. So reaction rate constant is one of the key elements of kinetic Somebody studies. Sir, 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 Hello? Uh, Shrini Enterprise, sir, not a company. India model in the world. Hello. Is there anyone else talking? Hello. I'm sorry, sir. You can continue. I'm sorry. All right. It's a small so, disturbance from the other people. You can continue. All right. All right. Okay. Noted. So, uh, reaction rate constant is one of the key elements of kinetic studies, and which is defined as the minimum time required to obtain the utmost or maximum extracted oil in a process. So, when we plot a long dy dt versus long y plot a graph, so from the straight line, we can get the intercepts, which is indicate the reaction rate constant values. So, all the plots were found to be valid, and then the values of the reaction rate constants are increasing correspondingly with the temperature. As we, we can see from the table here, it is increasing. The values are getting larger or larger as the temperature is increasing. So, thus, meaning, thus it is mean that the temperature is one of the strong determinants of the reaction rate constants, where the higher temperature allows a rapid mass transfer between the biomass and also the solvent and allowing it to have a higher extraction rate. But when we compare with a different solvent system, heptane is the larger key value compared to the other things, which means heptane needs only shorter time or the shortest time to complete the process or to get the maximum oil. So again, considering this reaction rate constant, Epstein still being the best, Epstein still being the best and also suitable solvent for the oil extraction from immobilized microalgae. So another key element of kinetic study is calculation of activation energy. So the meaning, the definition of activation energy is minimum energy required to begin the extraction. So when we have a larger activation energy, thus we need to have a catalyst on it. So from here, once I calculate it, once I calculate the yield, once I calculate the reaction rate constant, I plot another graph, which is ln k versus 1 over t to calculate the activation energy. So from there, I noticed that heptane yields the or acting as the lowest activation energy, which is 89.06 kilojoule per mole, compared to other two solvent system, which is higher, it's uh, what we call relatively very high values, thus making it, it is not industrially feasible, and we also need to have a choice of catalysis, catalyst. So again, again, have then become a major, major part or major, uh, Major having a major advantage in terms of activation energy to be replaced axane as a solvent. 
and the second part is calculation of thermodynamic parameters thermodynamic parameters over here involve calculation of enthalpy change calculation of equilibrium constant value k calculation of gibbs energy and calculation of entropy entropy change so over here i plot another graph ln yt and versus 1 over t so i notice that it is noticeable notable that the enthalpy change all are positive values thus making all the process are uh, endothermic which means it require output energy or external energy and also absorb heat energy from the surrounding and when we calculate uh, using the enthalpy change i started to calculate k first, which is which is equilibrium constant Hello. Does anyone is asking any question? No, sir. Uh, All right. Okay. Background noise Anyways. from the other people. You can continue. Okay. Okay. Uh, so from there, I noticed that the from there, I noticed the value of uh, Gibbs energy are negative, and the value of uh, entropy change are positive for all the uh, for heptane at uh, all the conditions thus making the process using heptane thermodynamically spontaneous and irreversible and also we have to know that the increasing uh, increasing value of entropy and low uh, gibbs energy by the recovery of bio oil from biomass is significantly influenced by the uh, temperature okay and then so from here we can know that again we can know that from over here from the value over here we can know that heptane still at the best uh heptane at a higher point we can say higher point where it is uh the process is thermodynamically spontaneous and irreversible for other solvents the process become reversible and also spontaneously not spontaneous as well as as not industrially feasible so thus making it uh heptane mixed with alcohol is less effective in terms of scaling up from lab to lab uh, industry so then then the extracted oil was trans esterified so when we trans esterify the extracted oil i noticed that we have uh we have yielded all the major components of biodiesel which is palmitic acid oleic acid stearic acid linoleic acid and linoleic acid so according to the european regulation a good quality biodiesel is produced when linoleic acid is less than 12 and higher content of oleic acid so from our current experiment we get to know that only heptane complies with the regulation as the potential to produce a good quality of biodiesel so from the overall uh, from overall research uh, from overall research area on the research article can be concluded that employment of various solvent system for oil extraction from immobilized microalgae has a huge impact on kinetic and thermodynamic evaluation as as well as the uh, fatty acid metal as a profile and the polarity of a solvent plays a major role by influencing the solubility and diffusivity of solvent into biomass thus affect the feasibility of the raw material while so with the highest oil yield and also lowest ener activation energy and promising values of thermodynamic parameters heptane is chosen the best and most efficient solvent can be used for the oil extraction for immobilized microalgae thus making it industrial feasible and can make up for further consideration of scaling up from the laboratory so i think that's all for me so thank you for the opportunity given thank you so is there any question from the member of participants Thank you so much uh, for your presentation, Mr. Nagarajan, sir. If any queries, they can present. I can proceed with the uh, queries. Okay. Thank you so much. Next, I would like to call Mr. Imran Rahman to present his paper with the topic.
topic of new enhanced wheel optimization algorithm for reactive power optimization. Mr. Imran Rahman. Hello, uh, are you listening? Yes, it's it's audible. You can start and the uh, present. Uh, screen is okay, visible. Yes, it's visible, sir. Okay. Okay, good afternoon and assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is Imran Rahman. I am a PhD candidate of University of Science Malaysia. Today, I would like to present my research finding in this uh, WCA SAT 2021 conference. The title is New Enhanced uh, Oil uh, Optimization Algorithm for Reactive Power Optimization. We are uh, three authors of this uh, article. Uh, me, uh, myself is Imran Rahman the uh, first author and then the co-author uh, are uh, Dr. Junita Mohamed Saleh and she is also the corresponding author and followed by uh, Dr. Noraz Dida Sulaiman. Both of the co-author, uh, they are uh, uh, lecturer in Malaysia. So let me start with the abstract. Uh, uh, here, I need to divide the abstract into three phases. First of all, I use the enhanced uh, algorithm to improve uh, the convergence speed and the global optimum by balancing exploitation and exploration process. After that, uh, the performance of the uh, applied algorithm will be tested among two things. One is the test function, that is benchmark function, and then uh, power optimization, reactive power optimization problem. And then the numer numerical studies uh, actually shown that the applied algorithm uh, performed better than the uh, existing algorithm in terms of two things. One is the global optimum and the number, another is convergence speed. So this is the problem statement as you see that uh, the WOA, while optimization algorithm, uh, this is actually a recent algorithm developed by uh, Dr. Mir Zalili and Lewis in the end of year 2016. So this WOA uh, has shown a solution accuracy lacking in reliability and requires more computational time to reach the global best solution. And also research studies on WOA uh, have been either computationally intensive or poor local as well as global exploration properties. So the challenges of uh, multimodal benchmark function optimization due to having more than one global and local solution. Here um, in this uh, conference, we are using these three benchmark function that are multimodal in nature. That is Schaufel function. As you see in the equation is multimodal. There are sine wave and also the range of function. And then restriction function and end up with the Cree Wang function. All of them are multimodal benchmark function taken from CEC 2015. Let's see the algorithm. This is the flowchart of the algorithm. So the algorithm here is uh, we use the special uh, step uh, mechanism from another algorithm uh, that is artificial fish swarm algorithm. And this algorithm has a step equation. We incorporate this step equation in order to enhance the global search capability. So the two mechanisms here are used. One is the encircling mechanism that is the in default, default mechanism of WOA. And also the AFSA step equation are incorporated in our algorithm. After this, this algorithm, the, there is a selection of probability happen. And after this, we will report the solution. And for this uh, algorithm, uh, the population size used 30, maximum iteration 500, a number of runs 30, and a number of variables 30 uh, been used. So these are the, the, the real world optimization problem that is reactive power optimization. From this equation, we need, uh, this is the power loss equation. This is the active power loss, P loss from this equation. And then we have also the bus J and bus I. The conductance is calculated uh, with the G. And then the voltage magnitude of the bus also calculated followed by the angle difference. 
So we need this is the objective function for the second application that is optimization of reactive power, optimization RPO. So the algorithm here we applied using MATLAB recent version and also this is the benchmark function uh, that F1, F2, F3 that is referred to these three function multimodal in nature that uh, we already stated in problem statement that is Schofel F1 function, Restrigin F2 and Griwang F3. So these are the three function let us see the modify our algorithm compared to the basic one, WOA. Uh, so this, it shows that the function F1, F2 and F3, uh, we need to minimize the thing. So the performance is better for F1, F3, and for F2, it remains same, the zero. So this is the uh, fitness function result. And in order to get the convergence, let us see the convergence curve for uh, these three function, multimodal in nature. So these are three functions, and this is the convergence curve of the enhanced WOA compared to the other uh, basic algorithm that is WOA. From these three curves, it's obvious that the performance of the applied or proposed algorithm is better than compared to the uh, original WOA. Let us see the result for the second application. That is, we need to reduce the power loss for RPO, reactive power optimization problem. So the proposed algorithm compared with the previous few algorithms that are uh, related to this swarm intelligence. WOA is under swarm intelligence. So we compared it to other underwater fish algorithms such as artificial fish swarm uh, and then the original WOA. Then another two, notable algorithm recently that is PSO and enhanced ABC. So this algorithm, we compared the performance of our RPO optimization with enhanced WA. From the chart, it shows that uh, the, uh, we need to minimize. So the value lesser is the better value. Here, the compared algorithm, our method performed better in terms of power loss optimization in megawatt. Due to time constraint, we cannot show the full method Technology here. So this is the this is the this one is the fitness function curve, and now this is the convergence analysis among those methods we already discussed that original WOA, artificial bee colony, artificial fish swarm, and particle swarm optimization. So the x-axis shows the number of generation where the y-axis shows the average of minimum values in logarithmic value. So our proposed W algorithm shows better in terms of convergence analysis. So after all those simulation study, what we come up is that this enhanced method uh, is also good for uh, the global optimization. And further, we have some, uh, we can do some improvement that uh, leads us to the future works. So the further study, uh, on this WA can be in terms of uh, self-adaptive behavior of the control parameters. Then we can also hybridize the local search with uh, WOA in order to solve the complex benchmark function optimization. And uh, not uh, and last but not the least, uh, that the application can be in power system, control robotics, uh, image processing, and communication network design. Uh, as we know that uh, the function, uh, the objective function is different for different cases. So uh, our algorithm can be uh, applied and the performance can be compared with others and uh, that will be another uh, point of research. So the uh, references we used are the latest one and we number 13, 14, 15 are the reference we compared our results in table number one. Okay, uh, this uh, research uh, funded by uh, IPS, Institute of Postgraduate Study, USM, and Ministry of Higher Education, Malaysia, uh, FRGS grant, as we show. Thank you. And uh, if you have any question, uh, you are welcome to ask. Thank you so much for your valuable presentation, sir. Yeah, you are welcome. Any queries?
Sinchas can proceed. Okay. Uh, next, I would like to invite the next participant, Mr. Christopher G. Francisco, to present his paper with the topic of Work Attitudes and Motivation of Faculty of the College of Education. Mr. Christopher. Sir, Mr. Christopher, are we audible? Am I audible? Okay. Am I audible? Yes, you're audible, sir. You can proceed and your presentation is also visible. You can start proceeding. Okay. Just wait for a while, sir. I will wait for... I look for my presentation. Okay. Uh, just wait for a while. I will ask my assistant to help. Sure. I will wait for a while. Can you proceed to another speaker? So go to the next happening. So do you need any assistance, sir? Yes, yeah, sir. Can I wait for a while? Sure. No issues. We'll wait. Sorry for the convenience. Am I audible now? Yes, sir, you're audible. Sorry for the inconvenience. Good day to everyone. I am Christopher G. Francisco, faculty member from the Nervisia University of Science and Technology, College of Education, Philippines. The title of my research is Work Attitudes, Motivation of the Faculty of College of Education, Basis Training and Teaching and Learning processes with my uh, co-researcher, Dr. Angelina M. Causo. The professional behavior of faculty of college of education in terms of their work attitudes and motivation play a central part in understanding the quality of their professional life, precepts, and work philosophy. Insights relative to the faculty approach to be service to students and their ardent aspiration, clear account, their commitment, dedication, efficiency, and morale. Faculties, work attitudes, and motivational to ad advance the welfare of their students are intensely reflected through the positive attitudes and motivation they manifest. The work life of and precept of faculty facilitate the emergence of extraordinary commitment and loyalty. College of Education faculty whose work precepts hinge on positivism are more likely to come up with a more responsive and efficient delivery on responsive teaching learning process. 
how the faculty view their probability of success is function of how they look at themselves such as subjective or objective appraisals of their work and motivation. The expectation influence the faculty of kinds of education, work orientation, and the values they uphold. Awareness of expectation in one's work and how these are achieved in the performance of work are essential look worth looking into. The quality of work life in an organization is an important motivational force among the faculty. Motivational forces in the workplace appear most relevant leading to teacher's advancement. Work ethics and philosophy has been found to be an important predicator of willingness of advancement in the 2002. The researchers who are called faculty were deeply motivated to undertake this study with the ardent hope that valuable data pertaining to faculty work attitudes and motivation can serve as baseline information to affect a more responsive and dynamic delivery of teaching strategies that may improve learner success in school work. The objective of the study, the researchers look into the work attitude and motivation of kinds of education faculty, specifically the researchers hope to arrive at valuable data and information on the following. First, work attitudes of college of education faculty. Second, the motivation of the faculty in terms of A, intrinsic motivations, B, intrinsic motivations. Third, the relationship of the faculty's work attitudes to the two measures of motivations. Last, whether the faculty of college of education across gender differ in their work attitudes and motivation both extrinsic and intrinsic. The descriptive type of research was used in this study. Checklist was the main tool to gather data with interviews and observation as techniques to validate findings. The method describes and interprets a phenomenon, a situation, or an, art, an event. It is concerned with conditions that prevail beliefs, point of views, or attitudes that are held. Process that are going on, effects that are felt and trends that are developing, the process of the data, tabulation, and giving significance of what is described. The checklist serve as indicators for dichotomizing the subject as more satisfied versus less satisfied. Five options are offered in the respondents to select from for an answer as follows. Five strongly agree, four agree, three undecided, two disagree, one strongly agree. To arrive at the verbal description of each of the items, the following arbitrary numerical guide as follows. 4.50 4, 4 to 5 strongly agree. 3.50 to 4.49 agree. 2.50 to 3.49 undecided. 1.50 to 2.49 disagree. 1 to 1.49 strongly agree. The procedure of analysis, the verbal description of item statement were arrived at using the weighted mean Kramer's B formula was applied to test hypothesis. No significant relationship exists between the faculties of kinds of education, work attitudes, and the two measures of motivation. Chi-square test was employed to test the hypothesis faculties of kinds of education do not differ in the three job measures when grouped according to gender. The following limits and degrees were used for the three job measures. Work attitude, 15 to 26, very unfavorable. 27 to 36, unfavorable. 39 to 50, moderate. 51 to 62, favorable. And 63 to 75, very favorable. For intrinsic motivation, 10 to 17, very low. 18 to 25, low. 26 to 33, moderate. 34 to 41, high. And 42 to 50, very high. For intrinsic motivation, 15 to 27, very low. 28 to 39, low. 40 to 51 moderate, 52 to 43 high, 64 to 75 very high. The result and discussion. Table one, degree of the work attitudes of the faculties of college of education. Majority of the faculty of college of education, 49 or 65.34 percent were identified to be favorable in their work attitudes, 11 to 14.66% were found to be very high. 15 or 20% were 
were observed to be moderate. Findings suggest that the disposition of the Faculty of College of Education toward their work is encouraging diligence in the performance of duties and responsibilities characterizes the Faculty of College of Education. Faithfulness and devotion in the completion of tasks typify the Faculty of College of Education. Table two, obtain weighted mean, verbal means, verbal description of the item statement relative to the work attitudes of the faculties of College of Education. The Faculty of College of Education strongly agree that they consider their, their role as instructor as a big challenge and are consensual in the performance of their work. In Table 3, degree of extrinsic motivation of the Faculty of College of Education. Majority of the Faculty of College of Education, 41 or 54.66% were found to be high in their extrinsic motivation. Only 7 or 9.34% were discerned to be very high. No teacher were identified to be very low or low in the measure. Result suggested that the teacher cognizance of some external circumstances that endow fulfillment and contentment arising from work environment. In table four, percents of obtain weighted mean and the verbal description of item statement pertaining to the extrinsic motivation of the faculty of college of education. The faculty of college of education is strongly agree to the following. Salary is enough to satisfy their personal needs and the needs of the family. They feel important among their co-workers and have comfortable working environment. Table five, degree of intrinsic motivation of faculty of college of education. Majority of the faculty of college of education, 68 or 83.35, were found to have favorable valuation along intrinsic motivation in their workplace. The solve implies the present of situation and condition in their teachers, workplace, and the work itself, and thou intrinsic motivation. Intrinsic motivation foster behavior among the teachers that is driven by internal rewards. In other words, teachers' motivation to engage in professional behavior arises from within them because it is intrinsically rewarding. In Table 6, obtain weighted means and the verbal description of item statement relative to the intrinsic motivation motivators of faculty of college of education. The good works they do as faculty of college of education are appreciated and recognized by immediate superiors and other higher authorities. They maintain mutual cooperation with co-workers and their work allows us to participate in development program. Table seven, coefficient of interrelationship to test by hypothesis teacher work attitudes, extrinsic motivation and intrinsic motivation are not significantly related. The three job measures of the Faculty of College of Education were found to be interrelated. The work attitudes of Faculty of College of Education motivation with an observed ratio of 0.455, which is significant at 0.01 level. This finding in reach of faculty of college of education are influenced the degree of extrinsic motivators in their workplace, the basis and motives of faculty of college of education to do their work properly and in order their being consensual in the performance of work and being always available whenever their services are needed, grounded on the presence of opportunities from promotion. Their superior's ability to stimulate a working spirit among them, their work environment, which provides a good fellowship, and the consistent implementation of discipline and having a comfortable working condition. Table 8, summary of chi-square to test the hypothesis. Teachers across gender do not differ in their work, attitude, extrinsic motivation, and intrinsic motivation. Findings suggest that regardless of gender, the faculty of college of education are alike in their work attitude. Intrinsic, extrinsic motivation and intrinsic motivation. Male and female faculty can be described as individuals who are dedicated and loyal in, in the observance of their duties and responsibilities. They're proud to be a part of the teacher profession. 
diversity in gender roles and expectation do not influence the working spirit of the faculty in their sense of good fellowship. For the conclusion and recommendation, deliberation of the findings scroll led to the following conclusions. Majority of the faculty of cultural education were found to be favorable in their work environment, to be in high in terms of the existence of extrinsic and intrinsic work motivators. The three job measures were found to be interrelated and male and female teacher of faculty do not differ in the three job measures. Deliberation of the finding and conclusion drawn led to the following recommendation. Based on the findings and the conclusion, the following recommendation were offered. Higher authorities in the research local should sustain and maintain the favorable work attitudes of the faculty of college of education and the prevailing extrinsic and intrinsic motiva motivators in their work environment. These are factors that promote productivity and efficiency among the faculty. Close monitoring by authorities of work, condition, and situation that may adversely affect the faculty should be undertaken. It is recommended that a sequel of the study be undertaken that will focus on the teacher's self-regulatory strategies and strategies towards cooperative learning approaches. Findings suggest that regardless of gender, the faculty of college of education are alike in the work attitudes, ex extrinsic motivation and intrinsic motivation. Male and female faculty can be described as individuals who are dedicated and loyal in the observance of their duties and responsibilities. They are proud to be a part of the teacher profession. Diversity in gender roles and expectations do not influence the working spirit of the faculty and their sense of good fellowship. That's all. Thank you and have a nice day. Thank you so much, sir, for your valuable presentation. Any queries from the session chairs can proceed. Next, I would like to invite the next participant, Mr. Carlo Jenstrom, from Bata Okay. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me, guys? Hello. Can we can hear you, but there is another microphone. We can hear you, please. The host, close the, the other mic, please. Okay. Okay, so good day, everyone. My name is Margo Jenster, Pico Sagrado, and microphone. Can you mute the mic? Please, 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 mute the mic. Mute. Please, we can mute everyone. We have a picture of the 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 picture the uh, accepting our paper to present here at the 34th World Conference on Applied Science, Engineering, and Technology. So our study is entitled Assessment of E-Learning Tools Utilized by IT Faculty of Programming Course in the New Normal. And the co-author for this uh, study is Sir Mark Silagleba. So I am a faculty member of IT Department at Pangasinan State University. Alamino City Campus, while Sir Mark is also a faculty member of PSU at Lingen Campus. So to begin with, let me just give you the abstract of our study. Actually, uh, student knowledge relies on hand on their, of their teacher and the use of different learning modalities like utilization of handouts, visual aids, and using paper or presentation and the internet 
help to impart knowledge to the learners. And of course, learning process is not limited in school alone. Rather, it continues even at home. Okay, but due to pandemic, we have what we call the new normal in education where the full utilization of learning management system, which is being used in the delivery of instruction. In PSU, in our university, we have two ways of conducting the classes. Okay, the first one would be the synchronous class where the teachers set time for an online conference or online classes and asynchronous, which means that the students are tasked to read and answer their study guide. But of course, uh, teaching programming is a different story. And programming course is a challenging subject for teaching and learning an introductory programming course at the university are very important since they are responsible of students acquiring of basic programming skills and knowledge. And learning programming course at university level is a challenge for both students and teachers, especially for students without previous exposure to programming. So in a traditional classroom setting, programming course requires the need to introduce programming concept through face-to-face -face lectures and discussion. And of course, actual application of these concepts are done with the aid of software tools in computer laboratories provided by the university. But of course, in, in, in the new normal, teachers are, should be innovative in giving their discussion. Some of the teachers actually records their uh, lectures. And during the synchronous class, uh, the teacher uh, ask updates or even uh, discuss further what is being discussed in the uh, video. Okay, so this study actually presents the discussion of the assessment of e-learning tools utilized by the IT faculty of programming course in the new normal. Okay, so specifically the uh, applications that are used in their personal computer or even in their laptop or I mean in their mobile devices that are used in writing codes for C language or C based language and Java. And this study employ a descriptive research to determine the satisfaction level of the e-learning tools utilized by the IT faculty members of Pangasinan State University teaching programming course in lieu of the new normal in education. So a survey questionnaire was formulated by the researcher based on a sample survey question adopted from uh, www.questionpro.com and of course validated by a staff of the Statistics Center unit and an active researcher of the institution. So the questionnaire was used to gather data on the profile of faculty members teaching programming courses, the e-learning tools used by the faculty and students for personal computer and mobile devices, and the satisfaction level of the respondents on the different tools being utilized. So online survey was conducted and responses were collected from 341 out of the 2,976 students among the six campuses offering BSIT program or Bachelor of Science in Information Technology. And using the computed uh, sample size of 11.46%, the distribution of respondents per campus is illustrated in the table. So, Alaminos, Asingan, Bayambang, Lingen, San Carlos, and Ordineta. These are the campuses offering the SIT program. And all items were measured on the following scale illustrated in Table 2. So we, uh, the researcher make use of a Likert scale where 5 is interpreted as very highly satisfied, which means that 81, 81 to 100% of the expectation were met. 4 is highly satisfied which means that 61 to 80% of the expectation were met and three is moderately satisfied, two is less satisfied and one unsatisfied. Now, based on the conducted survey from the six campuses offering the SIT program, there were 10 faculty members participated in the study. Two from Alaminos, one each from, uh, one each from Asingan, Bayambang, San Carlos, and Ordaneta, and four from Lingayen. Most of the instructor were handling more than two programming subjects. Five were handling two subjects and five were handling at most four subjects. 
Nine of the faculty members have been in teaching uh, programming for more than six years, while only one from the respondent was in less than five years in teaching programming for. So this signifies that the faculty members have already used different e-learning tools on handling the subject. Now, in terms of the delivery of instruction using learning management system, 100% of the respondents were using the MS Teams. Further, to support other means of communication and delivery of instruction, 20% of the respondents use Schoology and 10% uses 10% use Google Classroom. Moreover, Facebook page and Messenger were also utilized by the 10% of the respondents. On the utilization of e-learning tools for a programming course, the study found out from 341 respondents, 263, 236 or 69.2% have personal computer and 105 or 30.8% do not have. So students were actually instructed to install application to their smartphones, where provi which provide same functionality on an integrated development environment or IDE where they can use in programming. So the table below or the table, table four shows the um, different applications used in personal computer for programming. As you can see, Dev C++ is the most frequently application being used by the respondents. While table five shows the mobile application used in programming and from the identified mobile application used in programming, CPP Droid is the most frequent use application. Okay, table six now shows the computed overall weighted mean of e-learning tools for personal computers. So this is the satisfaction level on the different applications identified. So online GDB with a com computed overall mean of 3.17, which interprets as a student were moderately satisfied using this tool. And for C-based language, with an overall weighted mean of 3.84 for code block, 3.68 for Dev C++, and 3.51 for Microsoft Visual Studio. Students are highly satisfied with these tools, and it means that 60 to 80 percent of the functionality of the application are met. Okay, and with a computed overall mean of 3.88 for BlueJ, 3.72 for Dr. Java, 3.66 for IntelliJ. 3.73 for JCreator and 3.65 for NetBeans, all e-learning tools used by the student for Java-based language were interpreted as highly satisfied using these tools. So even though some tools identified are freeware, it provides features needed in writing and running the programming codes. Students using Android Studio and Eclipse for mobile, develop mobile programming development were interpreted as highly satisfied in using these tools with a computed overall mean of 3.43 and 3.77 respectively. So more so, Eclipse provide uncomplicated features and functionality to the users. Here, table seven, the computed overall weighted mean of e-learning tools for mobile devices. And on the utilization of the e-learning tools, Students who are using the Java and IDE with an overall mean of 3.05 and JStudio with an overall mean of 3.2, which interprets as students are moderately satisfied in using with these tools for Java-based language. So in comparison to JBDroid with an overall mean of 3.42, students are highly satisfied in using this tool. So JBDroid certainly provides features needed by the students in writing Java language using mobile device. And among the application identified for C-based programming, CPP Droid got the highest computed overall mean of 3.82, followed by C4 Droid with overall mean of 3.68, Decoder with an overall weighted mean of 3.54, Coding C++ with an overall weighted mean of 3.51, CXX Droid, with overall mean of 3.49 and CPP and IDE with an overall rated mean of 3.47. Students using these tools are highly satisfied, which means most of the features and functionality in programming are available. And table six shows 
the weighted mean, the overall weighted mean with its descriptive interpretation. Now, these tools used in personal computer and even for uh, mobile devices or smartphones are being uh, assessed based on the following area or indicator. The ease of installation, ease of use, the hardware, operating system compatibility, security, ability to integrate with other application, consistency with interface, application uh, software compatibility, collaborate with team, documentation, clarity of documentation, accessibility of e-learning tool support, overall reliability, and overall performance. So the next two slides uh, shows the, uh, the summary of the uh, assessment on the different uh, indicator or aspects or area where the application is being assessed. So this is for the e-learning tools for personal computer. And this is the table for overall uh, average weighted mean for e-learning tools for mobile device. So as for my conclusion, analysis of survey data obtained in this study showed that most of the faculty members were handling more than two programming courses and faculty members use Microsoft Teams as the learning management system with Google Classroom, Schoology, uh, Facebook page, or Messenger as the secondary medium for interaction. On the utilization of e-learning tools for a programming course, results showed that most of these students are using Dev, C++, CodeBlocks, and Microsoft Visual Studio for personal computer, and CPP Droid, GB Droid, and CXX Droid for mobile devices. And the result of the, as for the assessment of e-learning tools showed that majority of the students are highly satisfied with the features, functions, and support provided by these tools. As for the recommendations, uh, it is recommended that research studies must be conducted to assess the effectiveness of the different e-learning tools used in programming course. Other research studies must also be conducted to address the performance of the students and teachers during the implementation of these e-learning tools in the new normal. And thank you for listening. And that is my presentation. Thank you so much for Okay. Hello, the next presenter. Next, I would like to call Mr. Shiv Shankar Das to present his paper with the topic of framework for diffusion of clean energy products I'm done. in rural areas of India. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, are you able to hear me? Yeah. Am I audible? Yes, you are. We can hear. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, WCACT and IF ERP for giving me this opportunity. Uh, I basically I'm from Odisha. Uh, it's one of the poorest state in the country of India. And uh, this is related to my uh, uh, PhD research. I completed my PhD recently last year in 2020. And uh, basically, I'll be discussing on the framework for diffusion of clean energy products in rural areas of India, which was this paper has been written by me and my co-author, Devasri Dev Devrat Behera from Central University. And I'm working in School of Management, uh, Janet School of Management as assistant professor. So uh, uh, basically, it's a kind of uh, uh, come to the introduction. Basically, I was really fascinated to solve the problem of the rural areas, how the people are facing the problem in Odisha and uh, in rural areas of India. So uh, basically, this framework uh, was implemented uh, in the field. And uh, basically, how to enhance the quality of life for rural people was given more uh, importance. So whatever work we do, energy is essential for undertaking any kind of activity. We know that. And access to affordability of clean energy is really necessary for improved health and agricultural productivity. Use of clean energy is a way forward for achieving better quality of life. 
and india's problem is that basically we depend upon coal based electricity generation and uh, centralized system now challenge in india is to move basically from uh, fossil fuel centric to renewable centric uh then we have the uh, affordable to unaffordable energy system we need to move on right now come to the rationale of this study basically it tells that uh, problem in rural areas they uh, uh face the poor quality of life they have a low income and uh, energy related problem basically starts with the um, unreliable and unclean energy for lighting system in the household level presently unreliable and unclean energy for like agriculture and allied activities are being taking place so uh, this study was uh, here to develop the conceptual framework and how to uh, implement that conceptual framework uh, in the field and how this clean energy product that is solar light can help in income generation of rural people that was the most important uh, motive here now objective of the study is to develop the conceptual framework for diffusion of clean energy products in rural areas of india specifically to the areas of south odisha odisha is situated in the eastern part of india and is one of the poorest state and uh, uh, as i told more than 15 million people are living in south odisha and it is one of the poorest developed indicators in india and clean energy issue clean energy assess sorry clean energy assess is one of the key issue that is bothering the state civil society and the people in the region and this study will help the policy makers and uh, to support them and how the how clean energy products they solar light solar drip irrigation systems uh, which will help in the irrigation part it can be implemented in those uh, uh, field now this is the map of odisha and basically it, it is from india eastern part of india odisha there are 30 districts there are 314 blocks and there are about 5100 villages out of which more than uh, i think 3400 villages they do not have the electricity they have not seen as yet in 2021 so the methodology of the study is that second data was collected for understanding the uh, various concepts like actors factors and linkages uh, study reports articles and books were uh, referred value chain framework from porters was studied for developing now, now here due to time constraint i'll be focusing only uh, to the actors part now coming to the actors here different uh, literature reviews i have went through and i found out that uh, rogers ucardo silva and world business council for development study sun and park selco foundation and they have told there are different actors which are required for diffusion of clean energy products basically it starts with the experts consultants technical organizations then government and central and local level ngos public communities households families enterprise institutions government etc so actors are uh, those which are different from stakeholders right and actors they help they will help in diffusion of clean energy products so i gave my uh, own conceptual framework they had these proponents they have given their own conceptual framework so my conceptual framework basically consists of many actors here it starts uh, with the manufacturers facilitating institutions implementing agencies local service providers and rural consumers it's a kind of uh, you can say a supply chain right it basically starts with the manufacturers and it ends with the rural consumers now coming to the manufacturers manufacturers are those who produce clean energy products spare parts they provide technology at marketable prices now facilitating institutions can be the ngos fpos and you have the universities local uh, vocational training centers they all they come together they need to come together they work at local and regional level with the participation and involvement of the implementing agencies they need to create a market and financial linkages between different actors now financing institutions they need to provide fund uh that can be the government banks donors funding agencies they need to provide uh, monetary assistance to relevant actors as well with a payable interest depending upon the kind of projects now coming to the next one the implementing agencies uh, which i have shown in the conceptual framework they can be sgs self help groups cooperatives those who are uh, in the local area local field they need to identify the problem and address the common problem of the community uh, they uh, are responsible to implement the diffusion process with a close, a close coordination of other sectors as well which i have told the other sectors can be the manufacturers implement facilitating institutions and uh, the financing institutions now product assessment and process implementation basically focuses on the product assessment part the, what kind of product needs to be given to the rural people so that they can uh, use it and they can enhance their quality of life the process implementation basically focuses on coordinating the rural consumers explaining the benefits how the solar light or solar pump they can be used it can be used their financial viability subsidy availability and income generation how how the clean energy products can be helpful in uh, generating income 
Now, local service providers uh, are basically are the rural youth, those who are not doing any kind of job, and uh, they are the low community service providers. They need to provide after sales service to the rural consumers. That they are a part of last mile delivery mechanisms. They need to take feedback and communicate to other relevant actors as well. Now, uh, coming to the recommendations, it's the last one, and because I don't want to stretch more uh, details into this, it's a part of my thesis. And uh, for diffusion of clean energy products, that is solar light, solar pump, uh, there we need to use the NGOs, cooperative, and SSGs as distribution channels. We need to provide them training on technical and managerial, managerial aspects. Now, here the members of the NGOs, cooperative, SSGs, uh, they need they need to become a selling agents for the manufacturers, wholesalers. Otherwise, they won't uh, be interested. Uh, the, and, and, and different promotional activities like live demonstration of the product, pictorial advertisements, do-to-do -do -do campaigns, cycle rallies, participating rural melas, trade fairs, and conducting road shows and performing street plays needs to be undertaken so that the clean energy products like solar light, solar pump, solar drip irrigation systems, they can be, they can, it can be diffused in those areas. Collaborative approach, basically technical, financial, and consulting collaborative approach, which I've given a recommendation. Manufacturers need to transfer technical know-how information to the facilitating institutions and employment agencies. Government banks, donors, corporate houses, they need to agree to provide fund capital, provide financial assistance to the facilitating institutions and implementing agency. Consulting collaborations basically focuses on facility institutions, implementing agency need to collaborate with each other for mentoring, providing guidance, seeking support, and exchanging of know-how knowledge. So these are my uh, uh, recommendations. Sir. These are small pictures which I wanted to show that here we tried uh, to go for FGTs, focus group discussions, and how the clean energy product that is solar light, which you can see, can be uh, used in the household level. And training was provided to 30 CECs are the clean energy entrepreneurs. Those are local youth, those are not working in the field uh, of a cooperative. And they we provided training to them and uh, we try to uh, motivate them that uh, you go and sell the products. And obviously they need some money for that. And each product uh, you would sell, you would sell, uh, they would be getting 500 rupees or something like that. So it's, it was a kind of motivating which boosted the concept of framework to be undertaken to the field. Here you can see the door-to-door -door demonstrations. Here the rural people, they're using the uh, light in their home. Uh, they were earlier using kerosene lamps and uh, the solar light were used in grocery uh, stores, small tea stalls, poultry sets. Because, uh, because of the kerosene light they were using, uh, the chicks used to die. And we try to uh, replace those kerosene light with that of the solar light and uh, their quality of life, their uh, income rose. And uh, the solar light was also used in medicine, uh, variety, cloth, uh, cloth stores, uh, leaf making plates at homes, farmer fields, trade vendors and others. So these are this is a small presentation which I would like to, uh, uh, I showed you and uh, this, uh, this concept of framework was the most important one. And uh, the basically uh, we gave more importance uh, to how the uh, clean energy product can be diffused to the rural people. And there's the first thing. Second thing is that the cell service, the local service providers, the local people, they were trained and uh, they were given the products. They tried to sold it in the uh, rural areas and their quality of life, their income also enough. So this is what uh, is all about my presentation. And uh, I'm really thankful to uh, my co-author Devasri Behera and my Principal Sanjeev Patnaik, who has also helped me in this. I'm really thankful. Uh, so uh, this is what, if you have any queries, then please let me know. It's, it, was, it is a kind of, this uh, subject or this study is a kind of, uh, you can say applied research, which was applied in the field and it was uh, really benefited. It was benefiting the rural people. Now also about 730 rural farmers have benefited by using of solar drip irrigation system in South Odisha. So this much, I'm really thankful. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you so much, Mr. Shivashankar Das, for your presentation. Yeah, thank you, sir. Any queries can proceed. Uh, yeah. Yes. Next, I would like to invite Ms. Faiza Azim to present her paper with the topic of consumers' perception about sustainable fashion, a case study of Pakistan. Ms. Faiza Azim. Uh, yes, Assalamu alaikum everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Um, good afternoon, ma'am. Uh, 
my name is Faiza Azim. I'm a candidate of MPhil from University of Karachi, Pakistan. Uh, today, I'm going to present my topic related to consumers' perception about sustainable fashion, a case study of Pakistan. Now, starting from the fact about fashion industry, it takes about 2,700 liters of water to make one cotton shirt, which is enough water for one person to drink two and a half years. It is the most ugly fact of our fashion industry. The fashion industry, which is a global business of $1.3 trillion and employing more than 300 million people worldwide, it is one of the most resource intensive and emission exhaustive industry, creating huge impact <clears throat> as socially, economically, and environmentally as well. It is also, after oil, second most polluting industry on planet, creating urgent need to go down to the path of sustainability and to transform into a circular economy. While the concept of sustainability had been around for many years, in fashion industry, it has emerged in early 90s with the recognition that clothing can be manufactured in a way that is more environmental friendly, social and cultural, providing the basis for departure from fast fashion. If we talk about sustainability, then in terms of simple words, it is basically a finding a way to fulfill today's need without jeopardizing tomorrow's need. So in order to achieve sustainability, it is important for stakeholders to play their part responsibly, especially consumers. Other, con other stakeholders that can participate and can play an active role uh, are businesses, designers, and influencers as well. Now, what actually sustainable fashion is. Before defining it, I want to share some interrelated terms that are related to sustainability or that are used in replacement of sustainable fashion. These are, as you can see here, conscious fashion, circular fashion, green fashion, eco fashion, slow fashion, ethical fashion. These all terms are related to, basically related to the idea of sustainability. Now coming back to my point that what is sustainable fashion is, sustainable fashion is basically refers to the designing, manufacturing, distributing, marketing, and using of clothes in the most sustainable manner, taking into account of environmental and socioeconomic aspects. Here, sustainable manner means maximizing the benefits to industry and society at large at the same time, minimizing the negative impacts on environment. So sustainability in fashion implies that there is no mischief done to individuals or planet or our ecosystem when a thing or press process set in motion. It only improves the prosperity of individuals who collaborate with it, also help climate, in which it is created and utilized. So today, sustainability is not just a concept. It is the way of doing business. And from consumption pattern, sustainability means to rethink, refuse, reduce, reuse, repair, and recycle. Rethink means, as a consumer, be mindful for your consumption pattern. Before buying anything, think again, do you really need it? When it comes to refuse, we have the courage to say no to the products that are not environment friendly. When it comes to reduce, it means that we have to reduce our unnecessary consumption. Don't go for everything. Only try to buy those things that you really need in the idea of repair, it means before throwing your product away, you have to find a way if you can fix it easily and try to reuse them again. Lastly is recycle. Recycling is that try to don uh, donate 
old clothes to charity or to other people who really need them before throwing them away. So why it is so critical? It is a matter of life and death. I do understand that it sounds very demanding, but fashion does have a huge effect on over all the world. And the first step towards sustainability in fashion is to make our consumers to buy sustainable clothes and to make them to uh, use them as much as they can for many years. Am I audible? Hello? Yes, go ahead. Yes, go ahead. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. So why there is a need of uh, growing need of sustainability in fashion? The answer is here, fast fashion. It is all because of this term that is known as fast fashion. It is a buzz phrase in the sustainability world. Fast fashion basically has three characteristics. It is cheap, trendy, and disposable. It is the designing, manufacturing, and marketing of massive garment production at low cost by utilizing trend replication and low quality materials in order to provide inexpensive and disposable clothing to public. Fast fashion is a part of linear economy in which materials flow in a straight line. In, in linear economy, raw materials are extracted, goods are produced, used and discarded to landfill. As you can see here uh, in picture over here, that every step of linear economy or fast fashion manufacturing are imposing huge environmental footprints in terms of carbon dioxide emissions, water pollution, use of toxic chemicals, resource depletion, in terms of textile waste as landfills. There are the, some facts that uh, 17 to 20% water get polluted just because of fashion industry. Also, it takes 20,000 liters of water to grow one kg of cotton. 21 billion tons of garbage per year is creating just because of this industry. So that's why there is a dire need to move towards sustainability in fashion. So what is the other way around? What is the answer of this fashion industry, ugly face of fashion industry? The answer is circular economy. A traditional economy based on take, make, consume waste approach related to the concept of disposability, whereas circular economy is totally opposite. It keeps resources in a very loop for the maximum amount of time as possible attempt to keep up their value while being used and repurpose for the generation of the new item at the end of utilization. As here it is mentioned in a picture that linear economy is a leaky one, whereas circular economy work in loop as it take, make, use, reuse, remake, recycle, and then again take, make, use, and this cycle goes and go goes on. So there is no, no leaky leak uh, or gap there. So in the light of uh, present urgency or considering the importance of this issue and consumer role in such, such scenario, this study was conducted to assess the level of awareness among Pakistani women about sustainable fashion in Pakistan. This is the main objectives of our study is to find out the level of awareness of consumers regarding sustainable clothing, to know their opinion related to attributes of sustainable fashion, to investigate the factors that are responsible for making consumers to buy sustainable clothes, and lastly, to study the actions taken by consumers regarding clothes disposal. For our research purpose, we adopted descriptive research design, collected data with the help of questionnaire using Google module. A sample size of 385 responses were collected randomly. The obtained data were then analyzed by using descriptive analysis and the outcome was presented with the help of graphs. Now, moving on to our findings. 
the analysis of social demographic characteristics shows that respondent age group to uh, 18 to 35 had more awareness level also 42% of the respondent were employed and 54% were the students the majority of them related to the education level of graduation or above now findings related to sustainability in fashion 61% of the women are concerned about social environmental and ethical impacts of fashion sector but still there is a gap there is a gap of knowledge as about the idea of sustainable clothing the majority of participants believe that is only associated with the usage of organic materials recycling biodegradability as well as use of less less use of toxic chemicals in fiber manufacturing or clothing manufacturing while people are still ignorant of the fact that fair labor practices local production animal protection are also linked with the idea of sustainability so majority of people don't know about these terms that these are also linked to the sustainability curiosity about respondent uh, curiosity about the willingness to pay for uh, sustainable fashion 50% of the respondents are willing to pay extra but only if the product is available in competitive prices along with the quality of good designs um here um, as um, pakistan in pakistan majority of the people belong to the, the middle income level groups so here people do prefer uh, price levels while they going to buy anything so price is still a very important factor other factors uh, they uh, try to find out uh, while buying any clothing are quality and tempting designs in rela relation to disposal of clothes 75% of the respondents respond that they donated their discarded clothes to charity or gave them to their servants other option that is practiced mostly in pakistan uh, is that they passed on their uh, used clothes to their younger family members so these two methods are mainly used for clothes disposal uh, in women uh, by women in pakistan conclusion so changing the fashion industry and making it more aware of global humanitarian and environmental concerns demand expertise and above all fashion consumers can play a significant role in sustainability of fashion industry by making ethical buying decisions as i already explained that it is the most dire need of this time to create awareness among people because still there is a huge gap they do not know about the negative impacts fashion industry is creating on the result revealed that more people have gotten on board with the ideas of biodegradability recycling and use of organic materials but with but not with any of other concepts of sustainability near about 2/3 of the sample population concerned about social environmental and ethical consequences favoring more conscious buyers to pay for sustainable clothing but with the attributes of quality and good designs however there is a drastic need of creating more awareness about the negative impacts of the fashion industry among consumers as i already discussed in finding that uh, in clothes disposable area uh, most consumer prefer to give away their clothes Additionally, the analysis found that women who are between the ages of 18 to 35 and belong to the group of the student or working group uh, with education level of uh, uh, graduation or above are more aware. So there is a demand for sustainable fashion in Pakistan. Sorry. So there is a demand for sustainable in fashion in Pakistan, but it need to be upsurge to promoting the importance and need of ethical buying among consumers. enhancing consumer awareness about the adoption of sustainable fashion and this related to it is the key to achieve sustainability in fashion thank you thank you so much ma'am for your valuable presentation any queries can proceed okay next i would like to call mr 
Sultan Hussein Bekra to present his paper with the topic of effect of curing condition on strength of high volume fly ash roller compacted concrete. So Sultan. Hello, hello everyone. Hi. Can you hear me? Sorry? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you and you can start presentation. Your presentation also visible. Okay. I'm Sultan Hussein, a civil engineering student at Bursa Uluda University. I'm going to do my presentation about effect of curing condition on the strength of high volume fly ash ruler compacted concrete. My presentation is consists of introduction, material method, result and discussion, and will ending by conclusion. Ruler compact concrete or RCC takes its name from the construction method used to build it. It's placed with conventional or high density asphalt paving equipment, then compacted with rulers. It's produced with the material used in conventional concrete, such as aggregate, cement, and water. But unlike conventional concrete, it's a dry mixer, stiff, enough to be compacted by vibratory rollers. In addition, the high availability of waste material and RC production has been effective in the prominence of RCCs. Ruler compacted concrete is widely preferred globally due to its faster application, lower cost and high durability than those of the conventional concrete. The most area of using RCC is roads, dam constructed, industrial floats, as we can in the figure. RCC was developed as a result of studies carried out for the design of dams to build faster and more economically. The most important parameters affecting RCC properties are the compaction degree, aggregate gradation and type, binder type and amount, as well as curing condition. In the figure, we can see two types of uh, curing condition. One is standard curing condition, and another, the curing conditions that we are doing it in the out. Yeah. In this study, the effect of curing conditions on compressive and spl splitting tensile strength of high volume fly ash ruler compacted concrete designed by, by the maximum density method was investigated. Material and methods. In this study, a Portland cement and fly ash uh, confirming to standards are using. The mechanical, physical, and chemical properties of the cement fly ash provided from their manufacturers are given in table one. In table one, we can see chemical compositions, mechanical compositions, and mechanical and physical properties of cement and fly ash. We can see in the table one. In this study, as aggregate crime, crushed limestone aggregate are used, the properties of aggregate shown in table two. Safe analysis of the aggregates was performed according to Turkish standard. The gradation of, the gradation of combined aggregates obtained by mixing 60% of 0 0.5 millimeter, 20% of 512 millimeter, and 20% 20 of 12-22 millimeter size fractions and the standard gradation limits are shown in figure one. Here we can the gradation curve of combined aggregates that we used in RCC mixtures. Method. In this experimental study, the RCC mixture was designed in accordance with the maximum density method according to ACI standard. The cement dosage and the control mixture was selected as 250 kilogram. In addition to the control mixtures containing no fly ash, two different RC mixtures were prepared by replacing 60% of either cement or aggregate with fly ash. These are designated with H3 and B3 in the following pages. 
RCC mixtures having a water binding ratio between 0.30 up to 0.55 were prepared to determine their optimum water content. The mixtures placed in 15 diameter cylinder mold in three layers. Each layer was compacted for 20 seconds by a vibrating hammer applied on a steel pressure plat according to ASTM standard, as shown in figure. In figure two, in figure two, we can see the vibrating hammer steel plates that we use in compaction uh, for roller compact concrete, the additional ring, and a cylindrical mode. The relationship between water content and dry unit width of the mixture shown in figure three. The optimum water content corresponding to the maximum dry unit weight was determined from the resultant curves for each mixture. And water binding ratio of the mixture was calculating using these values. We can see in this figure relationship between optimum water content and maximum dry unit weight of each mixture. The optimum water content of RC mixtures increased with the substitution of fly ash. The increment in fly ash substitution led to an increase in the proportion of the fine material in the mixtures. Therefore, the water requirement and optimum water content also increased. Since the specific gravity of cement and aggregate was higher than that of fly ash, the maximum dry unit width of the mixture decreased as the amount of fly ash increased. Proportions of the mixtures with optimum water content are given in the table six. Here we can see the amount of material required to produce RCC for one metric cube. We control A3 and B3 mixtures. We had about uh, 250 kilogram binding and about 120 up to 145 uh, kilogram water we used in these uh, proportions. Curing conditions. The mixtures were subjected to two different curing conditions. In the first method, RCC mixtures were compacted in two different layers in accordance with ASTM standard using vibratory mallet and steel pressure plate. The produced sample were removed from the mold 24 hours after casting and exposed to water curing at the temperature of 20 degrees for 28 days. In the second method, an RCC platform of 300 centimeter length, 80 centimeter weight, and 25 centimeter depth was cast in open air condition. The platform was compacted into two layers by using a 70 and 50 centimeter steel pressure plate with the same process. The strength was determined by taking uh, 10 centimeter diameter, diameter scores from the platform, which was exposed to air cooling for 28 days. The average ambient temperature during this period was about 15 degree. Result and discussions. Uh, in this figure, we can see the compressive strength of uh, the mixtures and uh, splitting tensile strength of the mixtures that are curing in standard conditions and air conditions. <clears throat> From the results, we can see in A3 mixtures, we are cement was partially replaced with fly ash. The strength decreased compared to the control mixtures. While the opposite was the case in B3 mixtures, where aggregate was partially replaced with fly ash. The reduction in the strength of A3 mixtures was attributed to their high water binding ratio as well as the lower contribution of fly ash to the strain. However, the increase in the battery strength was due to the contribution of the fly ash to the workability and the strength as well as the low water binding ratio of these mixtures. And the compressive and uh, tensile uh, strengths of the water cured control mixture having no fly ash were 26 and 25 higher than their air cured counterparts, respectively. This ratio was measured as 29% in the mixtures, where 60% of cement was substituted with fly ash. The compressive and splitting tensile strength of the cured specimen derailed from the mixtures 
where 60 percent of aggregate was replaced with ply ash was found to be about 24 and 21 percent lower than those of the similar water cured samples respectively at uh, conclusion the replacement of fly ash with cement and aggregate causes the water requirement of the mixtures to increase. This situation is thought to be due to the fineness of the fly ash. In the mixtures where cement was partially replaced with fly ash, the strength decreased compared to that of the control mix, while the opposite was uh, the case in bay mixtures where aggregate was uh, partially replaced with fly ash. The, compress, uh, the compressive and splitting tension uh, strength of the mixture cured based on the recommendation were higher than uh, their oil cured counterparts. Thanks for listening. Let's finish my presentation. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you so much for your uh, presentation. If any queries, we can proceed. Okay, thank you, Mr. Sultan, for your presentation. Next, I would like to invite no, Mr. No. Osna Barik to present his paper with the topic of effect of fiber type and content on fresh and some hardened state properties of cementious systems. Mr. Osner. Mr. Osner. So, Ozna, can you hear me? <clears throat> Mr. Ozna, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? And can you see my uh, screen? You can start presenting. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Özgür. I'm a research assistant at Dursa Uzda University, and co authors are uh, Sultan Hussein Barkala, Yahya Kaya, and Associate Professor Ali Mardani. My title is Effects of fiber type and content on fresh and some high state properties of cementitious system, content, abstract, introduction, polypropylene fiber, polyamic fiber, basalt fiber, mechanical and physical properties of fibers, fresh state properties, hardened state properties, and reference. It's known that some mechanical properties of concrete mixtures, such as flexural, transverse strength, and energy absorption capacity, improve with the use of fibers. The presence of fiber in concrete mixtures positively affects dimensional stability and durability properties, such as abrasion and top resistance. Still, propylene plant, carbon fibers, as well as glass fiber, having high resistance to alkali are widely used in concrete production. In this study, the effect of fiber type and content on fresh and hardened state properties of cementation system. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, ma'am. Ms. Osler, would you like to uh, share your presentation? Yes, Do you wish to it? share the presentation? No, we cannot uh, see your presentation. We cannot see it. Cannot it's see not visible. Slides. Try again, please. OK. Now? No, it's not visible. No. Just open it on your desktop first. Open it on your desktop yes. and then share it. And on the middle of your screen, you can see an option called share screen. So if you click that, you can your entire 
screen will be visible and then you can share you can move what you want now now it's not visible so you haven't shared it yet at the middle of your screen you can see a green color option called share screen so that you can click that share screen and start sharing it maybe i should leave and again okay thank you and proceed i'm sorry Sorry, maybe the previous participant is still sharing his screen. I'm not yes. sure about what I can see, so maybe he has to stop. Yes, still sharing. Yes, definitely, ma'am. I will give instruction, Mr. Sultan. Mr. Sultan Singh. Uh, Mr. Sultan Singh, please uh, close your presentation. I did close. Yes. Um. Now, yes, ma'am. Now, Ozner. Now we can. Yes, it's visible. You can proceed. Thank you. Again. Okay. I start now again. It's known that some mechanical yes. properties of concrete mixtures, such as flexural tensile strength and energy absorption capacity, improve with the use of fibers. The presence of fiber in concrete mixtures positively affects dimensional stability and durability properties, such as abrasion and free stall resistance. Steel propylene carbon fibers as well as glass fiber having high resistance to alkali are widely used in concrete production. In this study, the effect of fiber type and content on the fresh and hardened state properties of cementitious systems was investigated. For this purpose, nine different fibrous mortar mixtures containing polypropylene, polyamide, and basalt fibers having a length of 12 mm as 0.25, 0 0.50, 0 0.75% of the total volume were produced. As the fresh state properties, the flow and unit weight values of the mixtures were determined. As hardened state properties, ultrasonic pulse velocity values, compressive and flexural strengths of the 90-day sample were calculated. The main drawback of concrete is its low tensile strength. In this respect, it's known that conventional concrete has poor performance in terms of ductility, fatigue capacity, post scraping load bearing capacity, toughness, abrasion, and effect resistance. Use of randomly distributed fibers in concrete is one of the most effective methods used to improve compressive and tensile strength and as absorption capacity and weak properties mentioned above. Another negative aspect of concrete samples is the cracks caused by poor dimensional stability. Researchers report that the use of fiber in concrete reduces the cracks. Fibrous concrete mixture was successfully used in different applications due to its superior performance compared to conventional concrete. In general, fibrous concrete production uses steel, polypropylene, glass, plastic, and carbon fibers with different aspect ratios. Propylene fiber is obtained by polymerization of propylene, a petroleum product with organometallic and specific catalyst under 2530 atmospheric pressure at 100 degrees. It was reported that the selection strength is positively affected by adding propylene fiber in cementitious system. 
It was emphasized that dissertation is caused by the fact that some of the load applied to the sample is transferred by the breaking ability of polypropylene and crack development is prevented. However, it has been reported by various researchers that high usage of polypropylene fiber in cement fibers, which are thermoplastic, have high strength, good electrical, chemical properties, low friction coefficient, and high abrasion, temp high temperature resistance. While micropolyamic fibers give superior results in preventing shrinkage cracks at an early age, macropolyamic fibers were reported to be quite effective in improving the axial load capacity and stress strain graph of concrete, especially the post peak behavior. In addition, it was reported that polyamic fibers are resistant to corrosion effects and cause energy saving by providing in application and pumping work. In addition, it was emphasized that polyamic fibers have higher tensile strength compared to the polypropylene and polyethylene fibers. Basalt fiber. It was reported that with the use of basalt fiber in cementitious system, the high temperature resistance, flexural strength, permeability, impact resistance, and stability against chemical of the mixtures are positively affected. As with other fiber types, it was reported that the addition of basalt fiber to cementitious system affects the comprehensive strength of the mixtures little or negatively. It was reported that polypropylene fiber performs better than basalt fiber in terms of flexural strength. However, the reverse of this situation was reported by some researchers. It was reported that this positive effect is due to the hydrophilic and flexible structure of the basalt fiber, which can be easily dispersed without separation in the mixtures. Mechanical and physical properties of fibers. In this study, 12 mm long polypropylene, polyamide, and basalt fiber were used. The fiber with the lowest density, tensile strength, and melting point is polypropylene, and the highest is basalt fiber. In the case of the mixtures containing 0.75% polyamide and basalt fibers, the target flow value of 200 mm couldn't be achieved due to the observational segregation. For this reason, the mentioned mixtures couldn't be produced. The figure show that uh, segregation fresh test properties. It was observed that the water reducing admixture demand for providing the desired flow value increased with the addition of fiber to the mixtures and the increase in the utilization ratio. In this regard, the basalt fiber containing mixtures showed the lowest performance. The highest and lowest use weight values were determined in basalt fiber. Ultra plus velocity values decreased with the addition of polypropylene fiber to the mixture. However, the opposite behavior was observed in the case of the use of polyamides and basalt fiber. Flexural strength rate decreased with the addition of polypropylene fiber and basalt to the mixture. This is due to the transfer of some of the load applied to the sample thanks to the breathing property of the fiber and the presentation of the crack development. Regardless of the fiber type, the increase in fiber content in the mixtures caused a decrease in compressive strength while increasing the flexural strength. It's thought that the decreases in compressive strength with the use of fibers are due to the increased pore amount due to the fiber not being distributed homogeneously in the matrix. It was determined that the compressive strength decrease is the most in mixtures containing polypropylene and least in mixtures containing basalt fiber. And references. Thank you for listening to me. Okay, my presentation is done.
Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Ozner, for your valuable presentation. Session Chairs can proceed with the queries. Okay. Next, I would like to call Mr. Sambadiov to present this paper with the topic of proposal of a load balance for a company based on open daylight. Samba. Uh, Ms. Osner, you can close the presentation. Thank you so much. The next participant is Ms. Samba. Am I audible? Audible, Ms. Samba. Can you hear me? Hello, I'm audible. Yes. Okay. Uh, good morning. I am so happy to present to you uh, my uh, solution. Yes, please share your screen. Uh, the title of the paper is Proposition of a Load Balancing for Company Based on Open Daylight. Open Daylight, open Daylight is the open source uh, solution to use uh, in a uh, SBN network. Our presentation will be allows. Sorry to interrupt you, sir. Your uh, screen is not shared. Your screen is not shared yet. Okay. Our solution. Uh, our presentation will be as follows: context, related work, our approach, proposed solution, and the conclusion. To implement the solution, we use free technology, Open 5GS. Uh, NBEOT and uh, SDN. Open 5G is the open source technology to allow you to implement a 5G network. NBEOT is an uh, EOT network that collects data, and SDN is a program network that separates data plan and control plan. In the, con in the context, the advance of uh, Internet of Things the advance of uh, 5G, the advance of uh, SDN, the large volume of uh, data to process, the very large number of collected, collect, connected terminals, increasing those competition, the imperative to improve uh, QIs, quality of service. In this uh, context, how to combine the intelligence and the flexibility of SDN the opportunities offered by 5G and EOT to improve, to improve uh, data management in enterprise. It is the question we have to answer. In slide four to slide uh, six, we are going to talk about some papers dealing with load balancing. The, the one, explore SDN to implement B, uh, B balance and algorithm cap capable to achieve one and assume traffic load balancing in with Wi-Fi network in order to provide optimal contribution of network resource and improve the overall performance. The two, propose a new load balancing mechanism, tracking advanced of by flow admission control. Transparent collectivity active with SDN is the button line of this work that ultimately offers the core network, maximizes capacity pre flow and improve the end use experience, experience through reducing latencies and downtime abundance. Referee from a US uh, EMS network proposed in Propose the use of load balancing mechanism based on the registration procedure in the reassociation request between the subscriber and the SCS CSF pair and refer to facilitate the redirect traffic results from overhead cell to others. Before the author proposed load balancing for web services 
using the last connection algorithm and IP Husk. The five goes beyond on traditional load balancing chem focusing in techniques that outperforms non-SDN approach in scenarios they are server side infrastructure begin to stress the six and the seven the six and seven propose, propose a load balancing between controllers controllers in sdn for six there is the load balancing adjust mechanism for application to each controller the proposed mechanism includes three, lo three logical components a load balancing collector, a load balancing balancer, and the switch migrant, which servant propose a load balancing mechanism based on the load information strategy for multiple distributed controller using this mechanism. Using this mechanism, a controller can make a local load balancing decision as quickly as possible. This experiment is based on Floodlight. Floodlight is a SDN. Uh, controller, uh, same uh, open the light. This experience is based on flood light, show that our mechanism can, can balance the load of each controller dynamically and reduce the load balancing time. What our approach? Our approach use uh, free technology, uh, free technology open uh, 5G, SDN, and uh, uh, NBEOT. Our approach consists to collection and transmission of data by open 5G and, I, uh, and uh, IT, uh, NB, NBIOT platform. The SDN, the script FDN. The SDN intervention for better equipment manager and the uh, user equipment. The same of these uh, previous rise to the fourth step is the objective of this work. Contribute to improve data management in enterprises. Uh, this uh, is the 5G. Uh, G and uh, MB EOT, uh, and this is the operating uh, architect who uh, we propose. The operating architect made up to three parts. The first part, the second is the gateway, and the three part we have a uh, IT uh, platform. Uh, in the first part, we have uh, we have open 5C NBT platform to collect uh, data, and the second part we have a gateway, and the free part we have a AT uh, platform or data processing platform. This data network aspect is the 5G aspect integrating the IT company. It's consists to three managed blocks, which are Open 5G Core, NBOT, and the sensor, the gateway, and the company platform, or the data processing platform. Thus, we have the 5 the 5GS technology, which is open source and integrated, and EOT module to to which the various sensors are interconnected. We also have gateways that play a role of link between the computer part and the open 5GS part in charge of data collection and processing respectively. The data collected by the sensor are processing to better service the community. The processing of the data collected by the sensor flows the flowing process. Plus, the collecting data is routing to the gateway through the 5G network. Then the gateway send the data to the computer platform in the charge of processing. Finally, 
the data is processing by the IT platform for any useful process. Our solution consists to as it consists in balancing the loads between the servers of the IT platform for a better management of the data and the equipment. Uh, we uh, see uh, the architects of uh, our, our test. A connectivity uh, test to verify uh, communication and uh, uh, communication between uh, all equipment. This screen, uh, in this screen, we, we can show the poor connectivity. Uh, host three and four response time before load balancing. Uh, we, we have a comparate test before and after load balancing. Uh, uh, in this, we have uh, the three and the four responsive time before load balancing. Watch our capture on for estimate before load balancing. The low thing, load balancing. Capture your wash after, after load balancing. We have compared uh, results before and after, after load balancing. Display of link course. Response time of the host free and fire after load balancing. We can also compare the response time in uh, host three and four after load balancing and uh, this before, before the, the load balancing. And our conclusion is uh, the load balancing is uh, uh, rarely success. In the conclusion, our article is a portion for a load balancing solution, 5G networks serve in the data network in the context of big data, 5G and EOT. Thus, it guarantees scalability and traffic availability, and thus data network manage and services quality. This contributes in this context of high demand of network platform and high uses to maintain the competitivity, the competitiveness of the company by on assurance. All this is an undeniable advantage, advantage in the competitive environment. Technology that are used to carry out this work are described without forgetting the various challenges they have caused uh, a biography. Thank you for attention. If you have question, you're welcome. Thank you so much, Mr. Samba, for your valuable presentation. Any queries can proceed in the session chairs. Okay. Thank you. Next, I would like to call Mr. Ulrich Herman Semavo Bokyo, Boko, to present his paper with the topic of proposal for an intelligent digital teacher's textbook solution adapted to the bachelor master doctorate system. Mr. Ulrich Herman. Yeah, okay. Hello, everyone. So, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I got you. Got me. Am I talking to Mr. Ulrich Herman? Hello, got me. Hello. Okay. Hello, can you hear yes, me? Yes, you can. Yes, uh, we can hear you, sir. You can present. Start presenting. Okay, great. I'm going to share with you my screen. Yes, please share your screen. Uh, 
my laptop asked me to, to restart the station. Sorry? My laptop asked me to restart the Zoom session. So I switch and I open. Sorry, sir, your voice is not audible. Do you see my screen? Hello, do you see my screen? No, it's not visible. Yeah, I think. Mr. Herman? Okay. Uh, team says a technical problem with Mr. Herman. Let him come back once he comes back, we can uh, have a session. I would like to call the next printer. Okay, I think it's okay. Yeah, thank you. Welcome back, Mr. Herman. You can proceed. Yeah. I think it's okay. You see my screen now? Yes, we can see your screen. Okay, great. <coughs> so this is my presentation. Okay. Okay, look, so good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Ulrich Herman Boko. And I'm soft, software engineer at Atos and uh, researcher at Laboratory List of uh, Charenta Diop University at Senegal. So now I will present to you our research results on the topic proposal for an intelligent digital teacher's textbook solution adapted to the bachelor, master, and doctorate system. This work was carried out by a group of four researchers and uh, this presentation will be done according to the plan below. In first time, we will, we will do a presentation of uh, the motivation of this work. And then we will present to you a main related work and our solution named uh, Smart Digital Teachers Textbook. After that, we will, we will show our results and we will finish with conclusion. So uh, since 2011, most French speaker African states have undertaken reform in higher education to better adapt their training to international standards. The focal point of these reforms has been the adoption of the BMD. The BMD is bachelor, master and, and doctorate system as an educational system. But in, in most sub-Saharan African, in general and in Senegal in particular, insistent strikes in primary, secondary and high girls education prevent teachers from completing the programs. This situation has a negative impact on the quality of education. This aspect is, is present by the author one and two in our literature. In addition, there is no quick and reliable way for the teacher to know whether students has the required has the necessary prerequisites. In that case, the author three make proposal on the digital textbook. This new approach has a positive impact of the international, of the intern organization of the institution, pedagogical engineering, and on the organization of teachers. In the meantime, in the, in the literature, in first time, we will define the, the BMD. What is BMD? The literature defines BMD as a training system that includes an, act, an architecture of study in three grades. We have bachelor, masters, and doctorates. In these systems, training courses is organized in semester and in the teacher units. 
So in one teacher unit, we have many courses. In Europe, the BMD reform is the result of a long process, but it's not the, the case for most African university. So the author of the study five showed that the fundamental prints of the BMD of the BID system are not yet mastered and applied by the different actors of the University of Abomey-Karavi. University of, of Abomey-Karavi is based in, in Benin, in Africa, in West Africa. <clears throat> so one, one of the main problem of, of BMD is the lack of time for the organization of animation meeting. So to facilitate the, pedagogic, the pedagogical follow-up, we propose my digital teacher's textbook. This solution is a digital solution that allows us to follow in real time the evolution of each course. This tool also allow, allow to ensure that the pedagogical objectives are, respective, are respected and achieved. So to, to implement our solution, we, we use this, this architecture, is a simple architecture. We have two, two main servers, one web server and one database server. Our database server based on MySQL. And in this part, we have uh, the access, access terminal. So we, we don't access our platform to, to teachers, which is a EC manager of a teacher unit manager and the formation manager. To assess our platform, we, we, we deploy our solution on, on website and he can assess by, by internet. Our solution based on algorithm, on this algorithm. On the first time, the essay manager adds or modify a, a class session. The essay manager is uh, the teacher. When he adds uh, a class session, our program analyze of the session contents and research for some keywords. After we, we, this research, we compute the percentage of keyword used. And the next step, we compare the percentage of keyword used with percentage of course completed. If the percentage of keyword use is greater than is, is greater or equal to percentage of course completed, uh, we send an, an, an email alert to the teachers and the teaching unit managers. So this, this is a, a main core of uh, our programs. So here we see when 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 we, we implement this uh, when we deploy our solution, we see here the the screen of the of the teacher when the teacher visualizes the course in his field of study. Here we we have one screen. We we can see each uh, courses of the teaching of the teaching units, and we we have a detail of each uh, course. Here we have uh, the name, of course. We have the percentage, of course, done. And, the, and, and this is, is a screen of teachers. Is, is a detailed view of, uh, of the course for the teachers. On the next screen, we have the detailed view of the course for the head of uh, teaching units, like, like we call UE. The difference here is the the head of teacher unit can see the keywords. The keyword which is used is, is tagged in, in green. And in the same time, we have the percentage of, um, of a respect of, of, uh, of course keywords. We compute this percentage by our algorithm and we show this percentage here. So in this case, uh, the head of teaching unit can know if the course is, is follow the, the recommendation or not. So when we use our solution, uh, 
where, where am I? So uh, the main contribution of the main contribution of our solution is an algorithm for automatic verification of course content and an alert system in case of non-compliance with the syllabus. This solution appears as a complete tools at the service of the actor of the DMD. So after using our solution for one semester, it means four months, we have four out of 10 courses manager which have received alerts by SMS and email to encourage them to comply with the recommendation of the syllabus. This alert made it possible to immediately review the content of the next course session. In addition, the pedagogical manager used the platform to ensure that the online courses were, act were actually completed in scheduled times. So in, in conclusion, the result of this work show that digital can be used to contribute to the BMD maturation process in sub-Saharan African countries. The adoption of smart digital textbook can contribute to solve the problem of pedagogical animation and course monitoring within university. Uh, our, our solution appears as a complete tool at the service of all actors of the BMD system. So now in perspective, we plan to integrate a synchronous communication space to, fac to facilitate the communication between teachers and uh, managers. So thank you for attention. Thank you attention. so much. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Herman, for your valuable presentation. Session chairs can proceed with the queries. Okay. <clears throat> I would like to call the last participant, Ms. Norazian Subhari, to present her paper with the topic of ASFA VOA, Variance for Enhanced Global Optimization. Yeah. Hello. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am, you are audible. Okay. okay um, Please uh, sharing your screen and you can present. Can't you see my screen? No, ma'am, it's not. No, it's not really. Wait. Let me... Yes, now we can see. Now again, it's closed. Okay, I try again. Yes, please try it again. Okay, can yes, see. No. It's visible now. Yes. All right. Okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, my name is Nora Zain Muti Subari. I am PhD candidate uh, from University of Science Malaysia, Malaysia. I would like to present a study on... AFSE WOA variants for enhanced global optimization. Okay, um, this is me, Nora Zabuti Subari, and this is my supervisor, uh, Dr. Junita Muhammad Saleh, and this is my co supervisor, uh, Dr. Nor Azubiza Sulaiman. Okay, um, optimization plays an essential role in all aspects of living, either in industry or academic, in finding the best or optimal solution for a problem. Meta heuristic algorithm mimicking biological or physical phenomena can be employed to solve optimization problem. Meta heuristic algorithm are becoming more popular in various applications due to their simple algorithms, easy implementation, and robustness in compared to most other algorithms. The algorithm can be categorized into three groups: evaluation based, physics based, and swarm based. But this study Focus, focus on swarm based algorithm, in particular of artificial fish swarm algorithm, AFSA, and swarm optimization algorithm, WOA. As a meta heuristic algorithm, AFSA involves two phases of search process exploration and exploitation. Exploration is global and usually random search by the optimizer, while exploitation investigate the found search space in detail. However, the optimization process is stochastic in nature and it is a challenge for AFSA to balance the exploration and exploitation search process to reach the sorry to reach the global optimum value. So what is AFSA? AFSA was developed by Li Jiaoli in 2000 
it is based on fish hunting behavior to find the area with the most food source. Hence, the area with numerous fish represent the maximum food density. AFSA also known as Swarm Intelligent Algorithm, which search the possible solution based on cooperation of fish swarm. There are three basic of AFSA hunting behavior, preying behavior, swarming behavior, and following behavior. In preying behavior, AF will move to the next position based on specific value of visual and random, sorry, visual and step randomly. So this is an exploration process. While in swarming, AF will move to the next position where it is located at the center of the food source. Meanwhile, in following behavior, AF move to the next position which has more food but less crowded. So figure one shows the pseudocode of standard AFSA. It starts with random initialize the fish population and then calculate the fitness of each fish. For each fish, it will do swarming behavior first and then followed by the following behavior. But if swarming and following behavior fail to perform, AF will perform preying behavior, which is the exploration process. And then the output for swarming behavior are named as X1, while follow output for following behavior named as X2. To find the best fitness, the output X1 and X2 are compact in order to get the best fitness. Okay, well optimization algorithm. WOA was developed by Syed Mirjalili in 2016. It is mimicking the preying behavior of a species, special species of whale called as humpback whales. They use their special hunting method named bubble net feeding. Usually they dive around 12 meters down and then start to, start to create a bubble in the spiral shape around the prey and swim up towards the surface. There are two mechanisms involved in whale hunting behavior. Number one, encircling prey, which is exploration phase. In encircling prey, the whale will recognize the location of prey and encircle them. Number two, bubble net attacking method, which is exploitation phase. The whale swims around the prey within a shrinking circle and along a spiral shaped path simultaneously. There are two approaches were designed in bubble net attacking method. Number one, shrinking and circle mechanism, and number two, spiral, spiral updating position technique. The, the decision of the will to approach the shrinking or spiral updating position is depends on the probability value setting. Okay, figure two shows the pseudocode of standard WOA. Again, it start with initialize the whale population and then calculate the fitness of each search agent as well as to find the best search agent. Each search agent will perform exploration and exploitation phase. As I mentioned before this, the in exploitation phase, the bubble net attacking depends on the amount of the P or probability value. For the standard WOA, the p-value is 0.5. If p-value is less than 0.5, then we will we'll perform the uh, encircle mechanism. But if p more than 0.5, it will uh, perform spiral updating position. And then they will calculate the uh, search agent value as well as to find the fitness agent search. The problem statement. It has to be noted that AFSA computes more on playing behavior, exploration process, and only compute either the swarming or following behavior during food hunting. Hence, it may get stuck at any of local optima when dealing with complex optimization problems due to imbalanced exploration and exploration process, as AFSA exhibit more exploration process. So this study, the main objective of this study is to overcome the inefficiency in AFSA. This work was set up into two. Number one, to study a new proposed AFSA variance algorithm by incorporating the WOA behavior in a case to balance the exploration and exploitation search towards obtaining enhanced global optimum value. Number two, 
to evaluate the performance of proposed algorithm on global optimum achievement based on test or benchmark function. Proposed enhanced algorithm incorporate the spiral updating position technique which is a local search technique of WOA into the standard AFSA. The idea is to add more exploitation process into AFSA using the local search technique of WOA. This should balance out the lack of exploitation in AFSA. There are three variants have been proposed, NMS, AFSA, WOAS, AFSA, WOAF, and AFSA, WOASF. The procedure. Figure 3 shows the procedure of algorithm for AFSA WOAS. Actually, the procedure is similar to the standard of uh, AFSA except for the swarming behavior. In swarming behavior, it will check the condition either meet the requirement or not. In swarming behavior, if the if the condition meets, then it will perform the swarming equation. But in this uh, new algorithm, it will apply the WOA technique to replace the swarming equation and update the new fitness value. And then methodology simulation parameter setup. In this study, uh, we are using uh, 50 population, 225 step size, 250 visual, 5 prime number, 0.75 crowd factor, and 30 dimension. Okay, test function use. There are 15 test function used in the simulation to evaluate the performance of the proposed algorithm. The algorithm is considered performing good if it's able to obtain the F mean optimum value. In table 2, we can see that the uh, equation for each test function as well as the range and also the minimum value for each test function. Okay, as for result and discussion. Table two shows, uh, show, sorry. Table two shows the performance comparison of global optimum value amongst the proposed variants. So the performance of the proposed variants were compared. So the total base in table two represent the total number of the test function that achieve the minimum value. As we can see, amongst the proposed variant AFSA WOAF comes out as the best proposed variant. So we can see here that AFSA WOAF able to achieve 13 out of 15 test function. Okay, and then the performance of the best proposed variant, uh, which is AFSA WOAF, shows better result compared to the standard AFSA and WOA. Table 3 shows the comparison uh, between the uh, best perform and the AFSA, standard AFSA and WOA. So we can see here that AF, uh, the proposed variants, the best proposed variants are dominant, uh, where they can, uh, it can achieve almost the, almost all of the test function at the minimum value. So hence, this demonstrates that the spiral updating position techniques of WOA is able to enhance optimization results. The conclusion, three variants of AFSA algorithm were proposed by incorporating the spiral updating position technique of OWOA into AFSA behavior. The proposed variant named as AFSA WOAS, AFSA WOAF, and AFSA WOASF. The performance of proposed variants were compared with the standard WOA and AFSA based on 15 test functions. Their result revealed that the proposed variants perform better than their standard counterparts. Amongst the proposed variants, the, pro the performance of AFSA WOAF revealed to be the best performed variant, achieving best global optimum value on 13 out of 15 test functions. So in conclusion, global optimum values can be enhanced by incorporating the spiral updating position technique of WOA in AFSA following behavior. That's all. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Ms. Mazraya, for your valuable presentation. Is the session chairs can proceed if any queries are available. Okay. Thank you. Uh,
before closing our conference session i would like to uh, turn on the cameras of each participants so that we will have a screenshot of the conference attended and then i can give a word of thanks for each participant uh, i request everyone to turn on the camera please uh, turn on the camera so that i will have a screenshot of the conference attended okay still any participants uh, wants to turn on the camera can turn it on Just a minute, so that I will have a. Okay, thank you so much for everyone participating in our valuable conference. And uh, for your kind information, in the chat section, I have given the certificate links and the feedback link as well to provide your valuable feedbacks. and we share the valuable feedbacks uh, to our ifrp and we have of this on behalf of ifrp as well i heartily thank all the delegates and students especially our chessin chairs and the keynote speaker who have contributed to the conference success thank you all for the participating in our conference stay tuned with us for more updates regarding the ifrp conferences thank you so much everyone thank you so all thank you sir just keep in touch and uh, please share your emails for future cooperation that will be brilliant thank you very much take definitely care definitely we will do it now yeah definitely we will do thank you so much bye thank you okay thank you thank you so much bye bye bye